set of faces that I'm looking at over. And um, it's been a wonderful time here in Australia. Uh, the the uh, philoxenia, the hospitality has been f superb, but more importantly, the spiritual in encounter and exchange that I've had with all the faithful and the priests has been quite enriching for myself and I'm very grateful to God for the opportunity. Tonight's lecture is going to be focused on the spiritual presuppositions of participation in the Holy Mysteries, becoming one with Christ. It's for everyone, this lecture. There's no one, I'm assuming there's no one here that, doesn't, that does not want to become holy. We all want to become holy and therefore we all need to know what the spiritual presuppositions are for our participation in the Holy Mysteries. We don't just want to do things right and be good. We want to become holy. And there is a phenomenon in our day, perhaps it was always this way, but it seems to be pronounced, I think, in our day, and that is that many of us struggle, and we have our temptations, we have our podvig, our, our askisis, but we many times do not see progress spiritually, or we don't feel that we're making progress spiritually. We don't feel that we're climbing the ladder of the virtues, overcoming the passions, becoming free. And we have to examine why. There are many reasons that potentially that's the case. One of them may be because we're ignorant of the spiritual presuppositions of participation in the holy mysteries. It is not enough, of course, to fulfill the external law without internal transformation. This is what the church offers. The church is a hospital that heals, doesn't just care for the sick, it heals. And that's the proof of the incarnation in our life, that the grace of God is becoming real in our life. We're not to be satisfied with becoming religious, fulfilling the law. Piety must not be an end in itself. If it is, this is pietism, and it is fruitless. It is egocentric. The same with the moral code and the moral law. Fulfilling that is not an end in itself. If the moral code was, it, was the, the aim of our life, then Christ did not have to come to earth. He did not have to become incarnate. That is not the aim of the incarnation. He gave that in the preparation of the old law to prepare us. It was a pedagogue to prepare us for Christ, to prepare us for the transfiguration, for the ascension, for the human nature to sit at the right hand of God. How different and how far that is from a fulfillment of the law, period, or a fulfillment of the moral law. This is the, of course, one cannot be immoral, but if one is only moral, only pious, and not being transformed internally, then the Incarnation and Pentecost is yet to be experienced in its fullness in our life. We are to be healed. And we must become convinced that becoming a saint is not only for those far away on some mountaintop, Mount Athos or any other place of asceticism, Becoming holy and becoming a saint is for every one of us, and there's only one gospel and one path. If we do not understand it this way, if we are not concerned about being healed truly of our passions, overcoming our, our weaknesses, in, in, spiritually speaking, then we are secularized, and we are content with being a secularized church. But we are not, as Orthodox Christians, and we must fight that spirit of this age, this age of Antichrist, which is making and desiring the church to be of the world, to be something that does not transform, but fits nicely in the landscape of the religions of the world, to make orthodoxy in another religion, and for everyone to be very self-satisfied with their religiosity, but all the same, not transfigured and not transformed. So we must return to the ascetic life again and again and again and fulfill the presuppositions of the mysteries without which the grace of the mysteries 
does not transform. The grace of the mystery is, of course, the, the side, the divine side of things in this synergy of God and man, of course, is given. There is no doubt. We are not Donatists. We believe that the mysteries that Christ is given and giving himself in every divine mystery. The question is, are we receiving him? Are we being transformed by this grace? Do we have what it takes? Are we prepared to receive the grace? If we are a broken vessel, the water comes in and goes right out. If we are a vessel which does not open up to the grace of God, very little comes into our spiritual life. So, again, we are here tonight to talk about the presuppositions of the mysteries. What do we see in the Holy Scriptures? What are the presuppositions that we see in the life of Christ and in the time of Christ? <clears throat> well, there are two basic ones. We can talk about many, but I'm going to focus on the two most basic ones. And that we see again and again in Scriptures. That are the presuppositions for the miracles, the presuppositions for the transformations, the presuppositions for the healing. Faith and repentance. Faith and repentance. We see it again and again. I'm going to give you a number of citations from Scripture to make it clear to everyone that if we don't have these two, and what are these? We have to talk about what these are because there is uh, uh, perhaps confusion among some of us. What exactly does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to have repentance, to be in repentance? We hear these words, but we do not understand them many times because we are infected, not just affected, but infected with a heretical view of these words because we've been raised in this Protestant uh, ethos and these words are thrown around. We hear them in the media and on television and they're used in a way which does not reflect the truth of the words. So we have to understand the words in context in the scripture. So let's look at a few scriptural passages before we go on to talk more specifically about the presuppositions, the more practical presuppositions of the mysteries. We'll talk about that as well. But if we don't get these two, if we don't understand the spiritual presuppositions of the mysteries, uh, which again are not just faith and repentance, prayer of course, and, and, and other things. But if we don't understand these, then the other practical things that we do to prepare ourselves for the mysteries are not going to be effective. We read in the Gospel of Matthew, one of the first references to faith is actually for uh, the great faith and trust shown by a non-Jew. You remember the story of the Lord coming into Capernaum, and there, uh, there is a centurion who comes and says, I'm not worried that thou shouldst come under the roof of my soul, of my, my roof, thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. And he says other things. I'm not going to say the whole passage. It's a long passage to, to, to get to the point. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. The whole approach of this centurion, that he doesn't need to come. I am a man of authority, I, I order, and you are a man of authority, and you order. Think about the faith of this man that he saw in Christ God that orders sicknesses and diseases and demons to, to, to depart. And yet he was not a part of the household of God. Verily I say, I have not found so great faith no, not in Israel. So here you have the recognition of Christ as Savior, but also trust in his power and his ability to save and to heal. These two things, there's two kinds of faith in the church. There's two kinds of faith, and we need both of them. We cannot be Orthodox Christians without the first kind of faith, which is actually recognition, acknowledgement. It's not anything but recognizing reality. The, the revelation of God, the creed that we read, Everything that we believe about the presence of God in the world is nothing but recognition of reality, the truth of things. So we're not, we're not, this is not some pious hope. This is recognition of the truth of things. That's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. So that is a presupposition then to trust ourselves, entrust ourselves to that person who we recognize as the true God and the Savior of the world. So there's both that are required. So he goes and he says later on to the centurion, go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto you. And his servant was healed the selfsame hour. So that again and again we hear this, this phrase, according to thy faith. Again, a little bit later, just a little bit further on in the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord is uh, sends his disciples into the sea of Capernaum. That's how, they, that's how we say it in Greek, Capernaum. And 
they are in the midst of the, the rainstorm or whatever it is, the winds have risen. Lord, save us, we perish. They, 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 they yell out to the Lord. And he says, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith, oligo, oligopisti? And then he rises and he rebukes the winds and they, and they marvel that a man can rebuke the winds. So again, we, say, we see here the combination of fear and faith. And there's two kinds of fear. There's the fear of God and the fear, as it says in the scriptures before, uh, the Lord appears to the disciples after the crucifixion. The fear of the Jews, it says. What does that mean? The fear of the worldly powers. Ultimately, the fear of the demons or the fear of, of death. Uh, this kind of fear goes along with faithlessness. The fear of God goes along with trust in God. So there's two kinds of faith, two kinds of fear, and they go to, the two of them are very different. And then a little bit further on, we hear of the healing of the paralytic. There is a man who's brought to, who brings his son. I brought a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed, I'm sorry, that not the son. And Jesus, seeing their faith, this is one of the most interesting aspects, uh, stories here in the gospel where talk about faith. The man is a paralytic. He's not bringing himself. Others are bringing him. And they are, their faith is, who, is, is the faith that heals the sick man. We have another version in another gospel. Uh, but the faith of those who are bringing the paralytic heals and he says to the sick palsy, son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And then the, the, uh, the Jews are scandalized uh, by, this, uh, by this show of the power of God that he could forgive sins. And we see how sickness and sinfulness go hand in hand. And so we're seeking healing, and we see the presuppositions of our healing is going to be trust in God and faithfulness to God if we're going to be healed of our spiritual sicknesses. And then later on, the woman who has an issue of blood comes up behind him. This is one of the ways that we approach the Lord. Comes with humility, that's what that means. Touches the hem of his garment, is not, is not bold enough to understanding her sinfulness, her weakness, her illness comes behind. She says within herself, again, not... Uh, having parisia in Greek, boldness without humility, but in great humility comes, touches the garment, and if I only can touch the garment, she says, I will be healed. And then he turns about and says, thy faith hath made thee whole. Thy faith hath made thee whole. The trust and the submission to me makes thee whole. So this is a presupposition of our healing. And we can go on. The, the two blind men, according to thy faith be unto you, the Canaanite woman who comes and begs the Lord, even when he dismisses her three times and says at the end that it is not right to give the children's bread to the dogs, humbling her again and again as a, as a spiritual physician and also wanting, wanting to, to see the, the faith and humility shine and she says, true, true, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And he answers, O women, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou willest. So we do, there's two things that are presupposed here. We will to be saved, we will, and we insist, and we persevere, and we're patient in our perseverance to be healed, and then we show faith and trust in the master. Those two things are presuppositions for our healing in the church. And we go on, Jesus heals a boy with a demon, and the disciples, the, the father brings the boy, and the disciples are unable to heal him. And Jesus answers and says, oh faithless and perverse generation. See how the faithlessness and the perversity, the distortion of the human being, it goes together. Faithfulness is restoration and also a overcoming of the distortion and per perversion. And then he says to the disciples when they ask, why could we not heal? Because of your unbelief. Again, another sign of the presupposition of trust and faith. If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence and go yonder and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. 
For the faithless one, everything's impossible with God. For the one who has trust and faith, nothing should be impossible. And yet, he says, it goes out by prayer and fasting. Other presuppositions for the mysteries. By prayer and fasting when the sickness is deep and, and the delusion is great. The barren fig tree, the Lord curses it and they marvel. And he says, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but you shall say to the mountain, Be there removed. And all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And then we go on to the, the references to repentance, which is extremely uh, important and basic and something that we don't hear much about today. It's one of the missing uh, puzzles to our spiritual life because we either don't hear much about it, there's not a lot of preaching, going on, calling the people to repentance, the necess necessity of repentance, what it means to, re to be repentant. But our Lord, that's how he began. He came to heal, and he begins his healing ministry by saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We have to examine the question, the, this, this term repentance, which is misunderstood. Many of us, I think, if we're thinking as Western peoples, think of repentance as a change of mind, a change of thought, that we, we think differently about God, we, we think differently about our neighbor, we no longer are angry or we no longer have a grudge and therefore we change internally our thought process about the other person, therefore we've repented. That's not the case. That is, certainly is necessary. We can't continue to judge him or understand our brother or God in a false way, but it's much more than this. Repentance is much more than this. The Greek term gives us a better understanding. Change of nous, that's what this is. And nous, the nous of man is, is used in the scriptures that St. Paul uses the word spirit or the eye of the soul <clears throat> as a way to understand the nous. It is the whole person, the whole spiritual stance has to change. And it's not a one-time occurrence. And it, does not, it begins, of course, with many times with an event like the prodigal son coming to himself, coming to self-knowledge, realizing his distance from the Father, not having communion, being in the, in the muck of sin and coming to himself. But it doesn't end there. If the prodigal had come to himself but not gotten up and left behind sin, he would still have been far from the Father's house. So it's not enough. And you'll see in Scripture, again and again, the Lord say, it's not enough to call on me, Lord, Lord. It's not enough to, to, to listen only to the gospel. You have to do my will, he says. So it's change of orientation, of, of stance. This is key. It's our disposition. What kind of disposition do we have when we come to the mysteries, when we come to confession, when we come uh, to, to baptism or the Eucharist? How, what is our spiritual stance? And that... That is the whole man. It's not just his thoughts. It's his, it's his inner, inner life and his, his, his disposition in terms of his soul. So this is, this is much more uh, all-encompassing. And, and, and it is something that never ends. We never end our path of repentance. We don't begin the repentance and then end it because God is eternal. If we are returning to God, there's no end to this return. It always increases. The grace of God increases and our communion with Him increases. So it's never-ending. And we hear in many passages, Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, the Lord says. It's not enough, He says to the, to, the, to the Pharisees. Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I say unto you that God is able these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees, and therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. This is a prophetic message for us today, as it is to every generation, that thinks that its inheritance is enough. Every Orthodox peoples, Greek, Russian, Serbian, Romanian, have a tremendous heritage, a tremendous inheritance, a tremendous responsibility. It is not enough to sit on that. And to think because of their virtues, because we're children of great saints, uh, therefore we have arrived. That's a delusion, he says. You have to have fruits meet for repentance. In other words, that change of stance, that change of orientation has to become a reality in 
the whole way of life, in your thoughts, in your words, in your deeds, in your impulses, in your glances, in your desires, that's what it means to become transformed. You see how far that is from pietism and moralism. A moralist and a pietist does not necessarily change his inner life and change his whole way of life and change his whole way of, of, of living, his ethos, as we would say in, in, the, in the, theological circles, right? It's not just what we're doing, it's who we're becoming. That's the key. He says, I, will, I indeed, St. Saint, Saint John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with the water unto repentance. So that whole preparation of the, of the Baptist was to bring people to a point which then they can be receptive to the grace of God, to the preaching of Christ, and to, and to later on, uh, after three years of, of Christ's ministry, to Pentecost. You see the prepara preparatory stage, and repentance is, is the key. And it's, so it's obviously not just a change, a one-time change, it's a whole change of way of life. He says, He that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is not a call to repentance which has no consequences. It's not a moralism. It's not a, it's not a good feeling. It's, certainly not as rem it's not just about remorse. I feel bad about what I did. I feel terrible about what I did. You know, Judas felt really bad about what he did. He, so much more that he hung himself. And he, was, he forever chose the path of darkness and not having communion. So remorse is far from what happened with Peter. Peter repented, he changed, he came back to communion. So if repentance doesn't end in communion, if repentance doesn't end in baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, which means transformation, which means communion with God, well then it's not true repentance. There's no point to repentance if it doesn't end there. Repentance under the forgiveness of sins, St. Paul says somewhere. What's the forgiveness of sins? Communion. Forgiveness is essentially being returned into communion. Forgiveness is not a legal contract that you no longer have. That whole legalistic framework that we have, especially in a lot of Protestant theology, is very far from the meaning of the gospel. The Lord came, of course, to the sinners to bring them to repentance. And he says, the, the scribes and Pharisees murmur against him because he, he made Matthew, Levi, his disciple, and sat with him to eat. <clears throat> and they say, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? One of the gravest sins that he could have committed socially among the Pharisees and the publicans. At the time, it was unheard of for a proper Jewish man to sit with public, publicans and sinners. And he answers and says that they... They that are holy, not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This does not mean that therefore there was some righteous he was not calling to repentance. Who is not sinful? And he is not saying here that there are those who do not need my preaching. Every human being. He's actually, in a way, subtly mocking the Pharisees for their arrogance and thinking that they are somehow existentially, ontologically different than the publican and the sinner. They're not. They all are in need of of repentance. It says elsewhere that Saint, in St. Saint Paul's uh, letter to the Corinthians, now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that you sorrow, sorrowed unto repentance. For you were made sorrow after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing, that there would be no harm done to you. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And so you see that sorrow for our sins has to be under, under change. That's when it becomes fruitful. That's where it becomes salvific, when we are changed. If someone goes to confession, walks away, is sorry but does not change, that's not repentance. That's not return. That is going and feeling bad. It's not the work of Peter, but of Judas. We have to change after the, the mystery of confession if it's going to be true repentance. 
Certainly we struggle, we fall, we get up again. No one is doubting that. But that is the aim, and that's the whole point of the Niptic tradition and the, the tradition of the, of, of the Exovologos, the confessor. It's not simply to hear the sins and, and give a counsel, but to give the medicine as much as a spiritual father can give for that person not to fall again in the sin, but to be victorious and to guide him. The priest is a mystagogue. It means he initiates the people into the mystery. Well, that, that, that presupposes that he's, he is guiding them away from sin and in, into, a, into a state which, which the Holy Spirit can then dwell in the, in the repentant sinner. St. Paul says elsewhere that in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. The Greek word here is epignosis, and the translation is rather poor. Epignosis is knowledge, experiential knowledge. So it's repentance to the experiential knowledge of the truth, to come in to know the truth experientially. And that's very different than a irrational acknowledgement of the truth. So actually the, the English translation misleads us. He's talking about repentance, which brings us to an experience and a knowledge of the truth. That's the end of repentance. And if it doesn't end there, then it's not communion. And that's the point of repentance, right? We're, co we're, we're coming back from the prodigal state to the Father's house. We're in communion with the Father after we've made progress in repentance. And finally, let's talk a bit about, before we get into the main, I think one of the main scriptural passages I want to talk about, which is, which is the, uh, in the Gospel of John. But here there is another example of the presuppositions of entering the kingdom of heaven. And he says it very clearly. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we not cast out de devils? In thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These are fearful, fearful words for all of us. Because we call on the Lord, and the question is, are we doing his will? Are we doing his will? There are many who call on the Lord, but are they doing his will? And they who do his will enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says, goes on and says, those who hear my sayings, and we hear them every Sunday in the gospel, well, those who hear my sayings and do with them, they are wise men. They build their house on the rock, the spiritual house, they mean. In other words, the fruit of that house is that they withstand temptation, they withstand the passions, because they have, they have tried their their virtue in experience. They're doing the will of God. The others who become foolish are those who build on the sand and they don't do his commandments. What are his commandments? His commandments are his love for us and they're his power for us. They're he our healing. The commandments are nothing less than, he than his, his blueprint for total healing and restoration for every human being. And when we do them, we become godlike. And we come to the passage, which I think is one of the most important passages for understanding what, it, what it's going to take and also what the stance of the church should be to each one of us. And this is something that is, is um, very problematic today because it, doesn't, it, it, it appears to work toward our salvation, but it undermines it. You'll understand what I'm saying in a minute. You remember the passage where he is walking and he turns and he says to his disciples, not to the Jews or the Pharisees, but to his disciples, uh, seek that meat which endureth unto everlasting, which the Son of Man shall give you. And then he says later on, they say, what is this meat which we want? Because they were, they were seeking after him because of what he had done in the desert. Remember when he fed the whole the thousands of, of, of people, they were seeking after him because of this miracle. And he says, that's why you seek me, but seek that meat which is under everlasting. And then he says, Moses gave you that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he, Christ himself, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. I am the bread of life. 
he finally says to, the, to his disciples, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. And then he says several times in the whole passage, which is very instructive, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. He goes on, he says later on, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath heard of the Father cometh unto me. And again, further on, he says, No man can come to me except it were given to me of my Father. So four or five times during this passage, he says that those who come to me and stay with me, this is very important because he's going to turn and he's going to say to his disciples, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And they're going to turn away. They're going to turn away from him. They're going to say, that is a hard saying. That is a hard saying. Who can, who can accept this saying? And... It's very instructive, his pastoral stance here, to his own believers, his church, his parishioners. What does he do? He lets them go. He lets them go. He speaks the truth to them. He, desire, he, he requires of them that they trust him. And if they do not trust him, he lets them go. He does not try to put them into the kingdom of heaven against their will. So much so does he leave them to their freedom that he turns to Peter and the twelve and he says to them, to Peter, what will you do, Peter? After having said again and again, whoever so eat my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, but my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me. And then he says to Peter, what will you do? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What is going on here? It's very instructive for us. It's required of us to do the same as Peter if we're going to be his disciple if we're going to make progress in the spiritual life, if we're going to be able to make progress in obedience and humility and in all the virtues. Because deep in us, in our soul, in our, in our mind, we have always the temptation of the enemy coming and saying, it's a lie. It's not really true. It doesn't really matter. Don't listen. Don't believe. Don't trust. And use your rational intellect to analyze things. You understand. Use this to analyze the words of God. And this is the, this is the path of destruction, the path of heresy, when we follow it. So we have to crucify our mind again and again and ac accept that which was not understandable to us. How could Peter understand those words? Those who trusted their own selves walked away. Those who trusted the master stayed in spite of not being able to understand what he's talking about. Any rational human being would have said, rationalist human being would have said, he's talking about cannibalism. That's why they said it's a hard saying. How can, it, how can one accept this? So clearly Peter did not understand, well, he's really talking about the Eucharist and, uh, you know, he trusted. This is, the same, this is the same one who will go on and by divine revelation from the Father himself, again, we go back, the Father sends whoever I have. The Father reveals to Peter. The Father is the one who sends whoever I have as my disciples. This is very important because we have the temptation, us priests today, to try to get you into the kingdom of God without you understanding or wanting the kingdom of God. You come and you say, many of, many of our people say, we want this mystery or that mystery, and we have no idea what we're asking. And we are not prepared to accept it. And even though we, they resist, we say, don't worry. Instead of allowing them freedom, many times we say, don't worry. This, however, deprives them of the freedom and the, uh, the, the necessary step of doing what Peter did. And that is crucifying their mind and saying, let it be blessed, Father. How can they become disciples of Christ if they don't trust without understanding. So we want, we want everything to be 
understandable and easy and applicable to us, no matter our struggle, no matter our repentance, no matter our faith. We want the church to come down to us, and by doing that, we're depriving ourselves of spiritual st progress, and initiation is a mystery. We are defeating ourselves, and the, when the priest goes along with that, he's burying the parishioner in his own rationalism. Are you following me? You understand what I'm trying to say? It's very important. We see it again in another part of the, in the scriptures. The rich young man comes to the Lord and he says, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Keep the commandments, he says. Adultery don't do. False witness don't do. And all the rest. All these things I have kept from my youth, what yet do I lack, he says. Jesus says to him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What did Jesus do? Remember from the gospel? What did he do at that point? Did he say, wait, don't leave. Let me, let me work out an uh, installment plan of faith. We'll get you on an installment plan. It'll be... Uh, you know, just a few dollars per month, and then by the end of the seven-year period, you'll understand what I'm really all about. No. He let them go. He let him go. He let him go. Free. He doesn't come down to try to make it applicable to our rational pea brain. Forgive me for saying that, but to get it really hard, it's, we can't understand, brothers and sisters, that which is beyond. We have to submit ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. We have to trust. And without that trust, the relationship will never make progress. If we don't have trust in a relationship, what kind of relationship do we have? But if you know Christ, you will love him. And if you love him, you will grow in trust of him. So there's something wrong if we can't trust the church when the church says, this is what it means to be baptized, this is what it means to come to the Eucharist, this is what it means to be married, this is what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. The church, Christ, See, we don't really see the church as Christ many times. We see that as the priest, the bishop, whatever, the canons. It's Christ speaking to us. When the holy fathers of the church in every age, the deified, the glorified ones, speak, it's not their words, it's Christ's words. Those are the authorities in the church. I'm not an authority, the priests are not authorities, unless we're following the authorities, which are the saints, which are the who are then following Christ in every age. That's when we have authority and everyone who listens to us hears, listens to Christ and obeys Christ. That's how he, that's how he ordered things. That's how he desired our salvation. He's the one who put the bishops and the priests to have the keys of the kingdom and to forgive and for it to be forgiven and to withhold and for it to be withheld. Not us. He wants it this way because it has to be incarnate. He has to be present in every age, in every time and place. He wants to be present through his holy ones and through, his, through, him, through the mysteries that he himself is giving and is given. But all that presupposes that you trust him, and that has to happen freely, and we can't, and no one, not even God, can make that happen for you. You have to make it happen. You have to want it. And you see the Lord turning to his own disciples and saying, Do you want to leave, Peter? inconceivable it's inconceivable that kind of freedom that he wants for every one of us knowing everything that he knew knows he knows the disciples will turn away before he, he he says those words he knows that he will lose many disciples by saying those words he knows that peter is not going to turn away he gives them the freedom to turn away though you see that that freedom here is something i think that many of us in the western world have lost because it's one of the, the great things that were lost to the heterodox I mean, when you have something like Calvinism, which is just unfathomable for the Orthodox Christian mindset, the outlook, where God chooses one to send to hell and another to send to heaven, that is a total misunderstanding of, the, of freedom. That's a rejection of the freedom in Christ. So we have, we have this, this Achilles heel for all of us because we're immersed in that God who is, a, a, let's say, only one nature. He's a monophysite. He's only divine. And, he, and he, just, he, he gives you salvation. He imparts it to you, and you just receive it receptively. That's not true. 
It's not at all true here. Look at the gospel. Freely we, we approach, freely we embrace and trust, and that's a presupposition if we're going to be saved. So, coming back to the stance of the priest and the stance of the bishop and the stance of the church, it has to be akin to Christ's stance. If there's going to be an energization and an activization of the faith of the faithful, Instead, we want, we want to do the mysteries as if doing the mysteries in and of themselves is some magical act which then becomes the kingdom. And we ignore the presuppositions that have to be there. We, as priests, witness to you the truth and love of Christ, and we freely give you the choice. You want to be baptized in the Orthodox Church? This is what it means. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about what that means in a second. You want to be married? This is what it means. You want to come to the Holy Eucharist? This is what it means. You don't want... You're up, it's up to you. But that's what it means to be in communion. That's what it means to make progress in the spiritual life. That's what it means to be united to Christ. So our role, again, is a mystagogue. The clergy are mystic, mystagogue. They're the ones who initiate you into the mystery. That whole initiation is a science that we have to acquire as priests. It's not something we just get because we go to theological school. We read a bunch of books. It's a mystery that we have to ourselves make progress in in order to impart it. And, but if we're not doing that, then what do we become as priests? And many of the people in the, faith, in the church today, in my experience, want their priests to be like this because it's easy. They want their priests to be those who do the services. They're the, uh, let's say, the master of ceremonies, right? They want to make it beautiful. If you're a good chanter, you're a better priest in the eyes of many people. Those kind of things. They want, a, they want the priest to be an administrator. They want a priest to be social, to be kind. And all that. Those are, I'm not saying those are bad things. Of course we need to be, do the service as well. But if, if that's what we understand to be the priest, then we have yet to understand the mystery of initiation into the mystery which he is supposed to be guiding us toward. And we as priests have to resist this temptation of trying to put people into the kingdom without them understanding or wanting the kingdom. And how do we know they don't want the kingdom? When they refuse to submit and crucify their intellect. When they stand and they do not say, you have the words, Lord, of the eternal life. Where shall we go? I don't understand what you're telling me, but I submit. Like Peter. That's when the spiritual life begins. There's a grave, grave danger with our approach to the question of baptism I'm going to begin with baptism. I'm going to begin with an historical event which will give you a little insight as to why it's such a danger. The question of baptism connected to faith. So infant baptism is, of course, practiced, has been practiced since the days of the apostles in the Orthodox Church, but it was always with presuppositions that the catechism that didn't happen for the baby before is going to happen after. What does it mean, catechism? To learn about God? No. It means to be initiated into the mystery. It means to be purified and to be able to be illumined by the grace of God. It's this whole process. We're going to talk about the purification in a minute. I want to talk about an historical event that happened in the West to understand how we're in danger of the same end, I think. In the Middle Ages, around the time of the Reformation, there was a radical Reformation, the Anabaptists. I don't know if you're familiar with the Anabaptists, but they're the Amish and the Mennonites and other groups like this. Well, at the, at the very outset of this group, uh, of this, this particular type of re reformation of the papal Protestants, I call them papal Protestants and reformed Protestants because they're both Protestants. They're both protesting against the church. Now, the reformed Protestants come in and they're saying, not just to the papal Protestants, but to the other reformed Protestants, because it was a practice throughout the Middle Ages, this is what had happened. They had divided the mysteries. The unity of the mysteries were lost in the West. The unity of the mysteries meaning that in the Orthodox Church, when you're initiated, you're not just baptized, you're chrismated, and you're communed. Those three mysteries are all present, in, and they're all mystery of, mysteries of initiation. They're not, they cannot be separated. Well, in the West, that was lost. So we got to the point where in the 15th, 16th century, where baptism alone is initiation into the Church. Later on, they're chrismated, and later on, they're communed. This is one of the major reasons why we have a distortion in the West of the whole vision of Christian initiation and baptism and the Eucharist is this, this dissolved today. It's, there's this total dissolution of this unity. So Protestant Anabaptists look at this and they say, well, okay, so the 
there being, there's infant baptism. It's just baptism. There's no longer any initiation. It's happening without any catechism. And now it's even identified with the state. So, you know, in Europe, there, was, there were local rulers who were Protestants and others who were Catholics. And if you were in their area, you were baptized into their faith, essentially. So you became identified with that. And it became very legalistic. It became very superficial. So there was just baptism, and it was almost seen as an initiation as much into Christ as into a society. It became very worldly. So much so that when the Anabaptists rose up and said, this is nonsense, the gospel speaks, he that believeth and is baptized, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth shall, not, shall be damned, it says in Scripture, and many other passages. And they're saying, well, where's the faith? Not only is there no category, but there's no faith, and then... And then it's associated with me being a part of a state and under a king. And then when they rejected that, wrong, wrongly ultimately, because they misunderstood, as many, ha many times happened in the Reformation, it was a partial answer to a partial problem, and they never got the whole picture. But they rejected that, and the state started to persecute them as threats to society. So they have many people who were killed for their Anabaptist confession of faith. Why am I bringing this up? Because we're, in many places in the Orthodox world, I think we're doing something similar. We're looking at baptism not in the right context and the right understanding. We don't, by baptizing infants, we don't neglect the, that they need to believe. That's nonsense. We would never separate any mystery from trust in Christ. But it needs to happen after baptism, as they grow up in the household. So what does this mean in practice? When we're doing baptisms with people who are not in the faith, mothers and fathers, families, when we're baptizing children without the mothers and fathers being a part of this whole picture, we're essentially putting aside the presupposition of faith, of catechism, of initiation. There's no basis. The church has to have some basis to do this economy. This is an economy of God, right? It has to have some basis to do this. It has to have some hope that, yes, we're going to do this, but they're going to be raised in the faith and they're going to be initiated into the mystery. So this is, a, this is the kind of dis distortion that happened in the West, and God forbid it happen among us. We have to return to the wholeness, the fullness of the understanding of the mysteries. So let's talk about baptism. The Lord, as you know, says to the disciples, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye the therefore and teach. Bad translation. The Greek is mathetevsete, which means make disciples. So the correct translation would be, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. King James gets it wrong. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am always with you. I'm with you even unto the end of the world. What do we take from this? That there's two stages in becoming a disciple of Christ. There's the discipleship and then there's the teaching afterwards. So there are disciples and then later on they're taught to observe all things. Think about that a minute. How, what does it mean to become a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to become a disciple of Christ? To train in the truths in both belief and practice, both dogma and ethos. You can't be a disciple just by saying, I believe in him. You can't be a disciple by just accepting the, the, the reality. Remember how we said the first faith, the first faith we're talking about, the, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. That is an acceptance of reality. You don't become a disciple of Christ by saying, that's reality. You become a disciple of Christ when you go from the image to the likeness, when you become like him, when you follow him in everything, in all things, he says, teach all things that I taught you to the disciples. So, in other words, we can talk about this process of becoming a disciple as purifying ourselves of the world and all that is contrary to the will of God in order to become recipients of the grace of God and to be able to activate the energies of God within us. It's not about learning about Christ. Catechism is not learning about Christ. It's being initiated into Christ. It's pu being purified. And purification is not just about outward customs, habits, ideas, putting away our idol-worshiping ways. Of course, 
It's not just about this, it presupposes this. Sexual impurity, unnatural sexual acts, worship of sports, tyranny of fashion, self-love, narcissism, all of that has got to go if we're going to be disciples of Christ. It means more, though. It means prayer, and it means remembrance of God, which brings internal cleansing. We started out by saying that it's not enough to get the externals right. We've got to have internal transformation, and that only happens through prayer, and it only happens through the remembrance of God, not the liturgical prayer. That's not enough. It's not enough just to go to church on Sundays and go through the divine liturgy. The divine liturgy presupposes a prayer life in your closet. The Lord says, when you pray, not like the Pharisees, presupposes, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. It presupposes purification through constant remembrance of God. It's not an accident that in the ancient church there was three years of preparation for baptism. Three years of preparation for baptism. Where did they get that? From the apostles. How long, was the, how long were the apostles with our Lord? Three years. And then Pentecost. Three years, and then our personal Pentecost in baptism. It's not just three years sounds good. We like the number three. That's what it took for them to be prepared for Pentecost by our Lord, and that's what it takes for us. Today, most of us, if we're converts to the faith, we were given a book or two, and then in about three or six or eight months, we were baptized or chrismated. Far cry from the purification that needs to happen. We hear in the Divine Liturgy, if we're doing the whole Divine Liturgy, depart, catechumens, depart. But most of us, if, we're, if we were catechumens in the church, we did not depart. Nobody told us that that's the time we should leave. We need to reinstate that. It's really important that anyone who comes to our parishes, they go through that process. It's very beneficial for them not to be exposed to the mystery before the time. They were not exposed to the mysteries of the gospel, the apostles, right at the beginning. They went through three years and then Pentecost. They should not be exposed to the divine liturgy in its fullness. I know it's on TV. I know you can hear CDs. So what? Let's at least keep that very basic thing and ask them to leave and set something up for them, for them to be prepared. There's many things we can do, catechetical instruction during that time. And I've done this with people, and my father, who was a priest, did this with people, and they love it at the end if they can be patient. Because when they finally are baptized and then communed in the divine liturgy, and the first time that they're present in the divine liturgy is after their baptism and they're communing, it's a totally different experience. That's the way the Lord and the church desired it. Otherwise, what we're doing, if we're giving, we're giving them a presence in the mystery, the uninitiated, we're contravening the words of the Lord who says, Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine. Not that the catechumens are swine or dogs. That's not what the Lord's talking about. He doesn't understand. He's not, he's not insulting people. What he's saying is, holy things cannot be treated as holy by those who don't understand them. Pearls cannot be understood and valued by those who do not understand them. This is what is meant by the gospel message. So, we're doing a disservice when we, as priests, when we have people coming to the mysteries and we, we run to put them in without them going through the process of purification. We're doing a disservice to them and we're cutting short, we're short-circuiting their initiation into the mystery of God. We're undercutting them and we're doing the same thing with the catechumens. We need to go through the process quickly about the reception of converts, which is a major problem in the Western world. The presuppositions of reception of the converts into the church, many places, Antiochian Archdiocese in America, the Greek Archdiocese almost all over the world, almost exclusively are chrismating people when they come to the church. Now this is a, this is a whole talk unto itself, I can't get into the whole talk, but I will tell you from the work I've done, and if you have my books here, I, don't, I think I, you said you had some books here, but in any case, I've written a whole book on this topic, and you're, you, you're welcome to read further. But this whole question is very problematic. Chrismation, economia, has its presuppositions. They're not fulfilled today. They're not fulfilled. There's no basis for economia in chrismation in the reception of converts today. Why? Because economia, the exception, cannot overturn 
ekrivia, or exactitude, which is the rule of faith. And that's what's happening. We're overturning the boundaries of the church many times, or giving the impression. We're overturning the integrity of the mystery, because the heterodox do not baptize today. The word in Greek, baptize, means immerse. 99.9% .9 of the heterodox, with the exception of the Monophysites, the non chalcedonians do not immerse. And so when we receive by chrismation, we're undermining the integrity of what a baptism is. And then we're doing the same. And this has happened, I think in Serbia, this is a problem. When I was there, I saw it was a problem. In Russia, it's a problem. In Greece, it's becoming now a problem. That our own people, our own priests, are not immersing. Because we're, we've become satisfied to believe that it's not essential to the mystery. That's clearly scholastic. That's a scholastic idea that we've inherited from the West. Economia cannot overturn the akrivia, the exactitude of the faith. Economia has to be temporary. It's an exception. It presupposes a return to akrivia in the end. So it has to be a diversion which comes back to akrivia. It's not happening. It cannot become the norm. It's becoming the norm. And our Lord gives us an example of what the proper use of economia is in the church. And it's very limited. Our Lord who taught us that to be in the kingdom of heaven, you have to be baptized in water and the spirit, turns to the thief on the cross and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Does he overturn his rule? No, it's an exception. Is there any other option for him to receive him into the kingdom? Can he be baptized? No. And this is a good example of our Lord's economia. And that is how, exactly how it needs to be in the church. Our Lord does the economia, not our human minds. It has to be clear. It has to be very clear that this is the only option. It's an exception, and it's salvific. Economia is a good thing. Economia is a blessed thing. Economia means salvation. When it becomes something that is a diversion and overturning the gospel and the revelation, it's not economia. It's, it's, it's illegal. It's paranomia in Greek. And this is where we're going with this whole question of the reception of converts. I talk about it today because it is a part of this whole question of the presuppositions of the mysteries. What are the presuppositions of economy and how, uh, might we, how must we uh, treat the whole question of reception of the converts in the church, which should be a major problem and issue for us. If we're in this world and this society, which is 99% non-Orthodox, this question should be a major question for all of us. We want to do it right. We want to have the foundation of the church on a sure footing and not on a distortion. So this distortion of reception, and there are there are, there's another example that we can talk about this distortion. It's based on scholasticism. It's, it's a distortion of our ecclesiology, and that is the vesting of clergy from Catholicism. You see this today in Russia. In Russia, they've, and they're continuing a, a practice probably started in the 17th century, 18th century, during the westernization of Russia. And so when a Latin clergyman comes to the Orthodox Church and wants to become Orthodox, they don't baptize him, they don't chrismate him, they don't even ordain him. They have a confession of faith, and then they put the vestments on him, and they say he's a priest. Scandalous. Not a part of our Orthodox tradition clearly a part of the scholastic mentality, comes back, goes back ultimately to Augustine and his view, which was a minority opinion and never adopted in the Orthodox Church. So this is, this is an example of not honoring the presuppositions of reception of converts. So let's talk about marriage. Marriage, we, there's much we can talk about. I'm gonna keep it short because I wanna get into the Eucharist. The presuppositions here, obviously, if we're talking about a mystery of the church, is that we have two communing and confessing Orthodox Christians. Because the mystery of marriage, as all the mysteries, happened when it began 1,500 years ago, 300 years ago. It happened in the Divine Liturgy. The presupposition was that these two people would commune of the Eucharist because they're in the church. And this was a part of the mystery of the marriage because marriage is three persons in the Orthodox Church, not two. It's not two people being united. It's two people united in a third person, Christ. Everything is in Christ and for Christ in the Church. Obviously, with all of what I just said, theologically speaking, there's no basis for mixed marriages in the Orthodox Church. That it's happening all over the place 
should be very disquieting to all of us. On what basis do we do what we do? Is it possible for us to do something so pervasive and we don't have any theological basis for it? How does it happen? How is it possible? Economia. I just got done saying economia has its presuppositions. Economia is salvific. Economia cannot overturn the acrivia, the exactitude of the faith. Mixed marriages have become a runaway train in America among the Greek archdiocese. And there's no light at the end of this tunnel. And I see that the, 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 the consequences are very severe. And I'll tell you just one, just one, which is, which, is, which is an example of seeing and focusing on the tree, which is this person or this couple in front of me, and losing the forest, which is the whole church and the consequences for the whole church. What is that example? There are parishes in America where you have 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, when you count it all up, that are non-Orthodox in the parish on Sunday morning attending divine liturgy. Certainly 20 or 30 percent is not at all an excessive number. So if you're a priest and you're coming to give the homily on the Sunday of Orthodoxy, on the Sunday of St. Gregory Palamas, or any of the great holy councils, and you have non-Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Protestants, uh, non-Chalcedonians, and they're a good portion of your parishioners on every Sunday, and of course you know that they're all married to another 10-20% of the, your, your parish, and they're all friends, are you going to give an anti-heretical homily? As a priest, are you going to say, say what you need to say and rightly divide the word of truth and keep the faithful mindful of the boundaries of the church? Highly doubtful. You're going to change your polity. You're going to change the way you work inside the communion of the church. You're going to start to change the way you view the church because of those personal relationships. All of this has been laid down by the Holy Fathers that this is not acceptable and it is dangerous and it overturns the faith at the end of the day. They're ignoring all of these presuppositions, all of these canons which the church says, do not ignore. It is very serious when you ignore these, there are consequences. And we're seeing those consequences in the life of the church in, the, in many places. Those who are returning from apostasy, without them being heretics, but apostasy in Greek means distance. Apostasia means you're at a distance from Christ in the church. There are many of those in, in Greece and Serbia especially, but in, I'm sure in Australia, where we have people who uh, grew up maybe in the faith, but when they reached 18, 20, 25, they became far away from the faith. They lost touch. They don't understand. And then maybe they get married and they want to come back to the church. They get married in the, in the civil ceremony. What do we do as priests? What are the presuppositions for their return to Christ? Well, they're going to be the same as our return. Repentance, repentance, repentance. Everyone in and outside the church is on the path of repentance. And that crucifixion of the mind has to happen for everyone, including these people. There is room for great pastoral condescension, but there cannot be an overturning of the norm. And what we're seeing again and again is that there is an overturning. Many times what I saw in Greece, I cannot speak, of course, of anybody but my own experiences in Greece, was you would like to be married. Date, time, deposit. <laughs> we'll see you then. You go to church, no questions. No questions asked. You're, you're living in fornication, adultery, no questions asked. You have a baby. Oh, you like to baptize your baby as well. We can do that too. Date, time, deposit. This is the path of repentance. The presuppositions of the mysteries are being fulfilled. Absolutely not. This is secularized church. This is a secular church. Salvation is not happening. Christ is coming, but there's no, the door is shut because no one is being initiated into the mystery. And we are responsible as priests. We are, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling and fearful to think of the responsibility we have when we do that. And there's no pastoral presuppositions, no reaching out saying, yes, the path is repentance, confession, attending divine services. You need to come to church. How are you going to live this life that you, you seek to live the life in Christ? That's what it means to be baptized and to be married. 
in the church. You seek to be united in Christ. How are you going to do that if you don't attend services? How are you going to do that if you don't confess the sins that, you've, that, that separate you from God? How are you going to do that if you don't commune? What are we doing? Are we mocking God? It seems like we are. I'm talking about the clergy. We're mocking God. I have many stories to tell you. I won't bore you, although they're very interesting, actually. They're not boring at all, but we can't get into a lot of them. I'll just tell you one or two quick stories. One that is amazing to me, and I lived it, and I still don't believe it. But for me, it was a lesson from God why we need to stay on course and don't go back. It helps people on the path of salvation. So I had the president of the village come to me. Wanted, it was, I think, May, or maybe, no, it was April, and he wanted in the end of August to have his daughter married and to have the baptism of their child. They were both the daughter and the, the man he, she was with. Of course, we're not a part of the church. We're not married in the church. The baby was not baptized. I think he was one or two years old at this point. And he comes to me and he said, knowing my position, he comes to me and says, my daughter will be married. I say, I'll talk to your daughter. We'll talk to your daughter about it. We'll tell her to come and see me. She comes and see me. And I must say, she was very kind. But I, I, I asked her, you need to come to church. I need to have something that I'm going to stand on and say, Lord, I didn't ignore your presuppositions. I didn't ignore your law when I reached out to these people. I, I have something. They have piety. They have desire. They're doing something. They want to be a part of the church. They're on the path of repentance. I need something. I can't just ignore. It, it's unfathomable for me just to ignore everything and say, date, time, deposit. So I said, you need to come to church. And there's confession because you've been living in fornication. That's what we call it in the church. It's called fornication. It's sinful. You've got to repent of that. Okay, all right, we'll think about that. She calls me back the next day. Do you think we could have another priest come to do the service in my church? I said, uh, let, me th- let me call you back. I, I, ta- I talked to my spiritual father. He says, are you serious? Stricter. Not, you should be stricter with her when she, when she has such boldness and such, you know, to be honest, I don't think she was saying it. I think somebody else was telling her to say it. So anyway, I, I call her back. We, we agree. We meet. I say, if that's how you want to go about it, I can't do the service. Go talk to the bishop. She goes and talks to the bishop. The bishop says, I'll do this. we'll do the services with another priest, but not on the same day. Oh, no, 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 we got to have the same day, the father. we got to have the same day. The bishop says, no way. I'm not doing it the same day because it's a mockery. It's a mockery. The whole thing is a mockery. We have to at least separate it by several months, marriage and then baptism. That's the order of things in the church. At least give us that much. So we have, the bar has come down, down, down at this point. So the feast day comes. The bishop comes to the church. He's upset with me because I refuse to do the service. He's upset with the father because the father insists that it happens on the same day. In any case, the father insists, and the bishop drives away upset. So then a week later, we have, we have a feast day on the mountain uh, for, the, for, the, for the feast. We go up to a chapel in the mountain, and the, uh, the poor man's wife suffers a stroke. God, thank God it wasn't serious, and she gets by it. Two weeks later, she gets in a terrible car accident, totals the car with her son. Thanks be to God, she walks away. A couple days later, this is all all weeks away from the the, the ceremony, right? Weeks away from the marriage and the the baptism. A couple days later, the father suffers a stroke, goes to the hospital, they call off the marriage, they call off the baptism. This is not an accident. He was resisting me as a priest. Okay, I'm just a priest. He's resisting the bishop. And God says, this is not the way you go about salvation. This is not how you're going to enter the kingdom of God. And he suffered, and he recovered. And now he's with, after years, he's reposed. Now he's in, in heaven, I hope. My point is, we, this, we, need, we can't ignore these things. They're spiritual laws. And when we ignore the spiritual laws, we pay some price in order to bring us back to our senses. So that's just one story of many that I could tell you from my time in Greece in which we had to deal with these again and again because Greece, is in a, as in most places, it, the youth are in apostasy. They're gone. They're, they're, they're history. They're, they're, they're far from the church. Of course, we have the, the lima, the, 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 uh, the small you know, flock 
the little flock, always. But this is what's happening. Let's talk about the Eucharist because I'm getting over my time. Forgive me for running late. I want to talk about the Eucharist for a minute and how important it is for us to approach the Eucharist so that we can walk away transformed and not the same again and again. St. Gregory Palamas teaches us that the healing that takes place, that must take place in the church and the mysteries, is achieved through mysteriological, sacramental, and hesychastic life in combination. And outside of this, this unity of sacramental and ascetic or sacramental and hesychastic life, there is no orthodox life, no spirituality, no theology. Do I need to repeat that? That's really important. You cannot have a sacramental life apart from a hesychastic, ascetical life. It doesn't work. It's not synergy. It's not God and man working together. It's just the externals. We take the, the mysteries of God and we make them into externals. And God's hands are tied because our freedom, our disposition, our zeal, our desire for healing is not there. We have to have the ascetic life. We have to have the hesychastic life. The energies of God, the grace of God, enters our hearts through communion and ascetic practices which prepare the soil of our heart to receive the grace of God. Receiving communion isn't a right, but a gift. It presupposes repentance, confession, and so on. We should receive this, of course, as often as possible, but in a state of preparation, in a state in which the soil has been prepared so that the seed can fall. It is very important that we attend Vespers or Vigil on Saturday night or for the feast day, that we prepare the night before with prayer, not with worldly activities, not with partying, not with drinking, none of that, if we're going to receive the mysteries. That's just a basic, the fear of God and trust in God demands that of us. We should receive Holy Communion. If, if we do not do that, we should not receive Holy Communion, period. We should have a rule and not go against that rule. Early on Saturday, we should already be preparing for Saturday night and Sunday morning with a sense of approaching the Lord as a beggar. We're going to Him and we're saying, Clean my house. It's dirty. I need to be cleansed. I'm sick. I need to be healed. We need to go with prayer for what we really need help with. We're struggling with passion of anger. We go to the Lord in the Eucharist and we pray, Lord, free me from this slavery to anger. We pray hard to be free of the passions. He can give us the power through the mysteries, through asceticism, to do that. There was a holy bishop, Nectarios, who, who said the following, Be not quick to spill out the grace you have received. So you've gone to the mystery. Now what? It's not, it doesn't end there. Oh, I've communed. I think I'll leave now. You see that. It's unbelievable. People don't even stay to hear the prayers. They don't stay to say thank you. Say thank you for the Lord. He just gave you his own body and blood. Stay, stay in the, mystery, the church and pray. St. John Shanghai in San Francisco stayed for two and three hours after divine liturgy, praying in the altar. That's why he became St. John, the wonder worker. You have to keep the grace. We struggle to put off the old man, put off the passions, put on Christ, and then we've got to keep Christ within us. It's not enough just to get him. We're going to lose him again if we don't have watchfulness and prayer. Don't go out and chatter. Don't go out and, 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 and lose yourself outside of yourself. Watchfulness. He says... The bishop says, when you fall in love, you don't run from that person. And likewise, you've just received Christ. His blood is literally in your veins. Stay and spend some time with him. Take at least 10 minutes to give thanks. The idea of preparation correlates with people arriving to liturgy on time. If we don't go on time to church... This is a lack of preparation. It's a lack of fear of God. It's a lack of love of God. We go there on time. Of course, there are times when we're, we're prevented. We're not talking about the exceptions. Our disposition, that's the question. What disposition do we have? Here's just a short list in terms of some practical things that can help people. What do I need to do in terms of preparation? We fast according to the typicon of the church under the guidance of our spiritual father. What does that mean? The fast of the church. We keep them. Fasting is not a question of asceticism. It's a question of obedience. 
That's how we should understand fasting, first and foremost. Second, secondarily, it's a question of asceticism. First, it's a question of obedience. That's why the church, the priest, the parish, the bishop should never put food during fasting periods which is not fasting. It's not a question of do we all or not, not do this kind of fast or that kind of fast. It's the church. It's Christ teaching. How can we teach one thing and do another? We have to at least say, in this community, we're going to keep the fast, obedience to the fast. Now, is fasting about eating only? Of course not. That's just one small part of it. The fast needs to be spiritual as well. We need to fast from sin, fast from anger, fast from lust, of course. We need to fast from internet, television, turn it off during the fast. All of that is a part of it. We're not going to get into fasting today, but that's a part of the preparation for Holy Communion. Prayer in the services, beforehand, Vespers, Matins, if your church does it, the hours. Say in the pre-communion prayers, we have pre-communion prayers, 12, we have the canon. Fasting from all food in the morning, of course, under the guidance of our confessor. If we have some kind of sickness, we take a pill, that's another thing. But if we're not eating in the morning, obviously, before we go to divine liturgy. The husband and the wife abstain from sexual relations. In the Old Testament, before Moses, when Moses went up in the mount, he said, for three days, abstain, do not have sexual relations. We take that, and many elders take that as, as a rule for three days, three nights. Others say two. You have a spiritual father, you go to him. In any case, there's an ascetic struggle in that area as well when we prepare to receive Holy Communion. The evening before, we said we don't uh, do worldly activities. And I would say... Sunday should be set aside generally for prayer and for preparation. So let me talk quickly about ordination. Let me go very quickly through the basic presuppositions. There are canons, many of them, which set, the church sets down what and how do we approach this, the ordination. First of all, we have to, someone who's going to become a priest or a deacon has a canonical age, 30, or a deacon, 25. That's oftentimes put aside today. Uh, I think that unless there's a serious reason that should not be the case, but I'm not a bishop, so it's not my call, but that is the canonical age. One has to be obviously mature and strong and, and uh, prepared to be a, a guide to others, and that's why the church has that age. There are physical defects and illnesses which prevent somebody becoming a priest, according to the canons. If someone has dep is, is deaf or blind, obviously, it's not because he has sinfulness, but because he cannot function uh, and do the affairs of the church. That's another presupposition. If one is mentally ill, he cannot be a priest. If one has fallen away into apostasy, obviously he cannot become a priest, and he should not be put in a position of authority. Uh, he must be tried and, and tested for his faithfulness to the church. Uh, recent converts should not be priests. We see this happening all the time. People are priests almost immediately upon reception because they're bringing in people, they're bringing in a flock. That's an economy, that's a very dangerous economy, and it's not uh, blessed by the canons. In any case, the bishop can do that economy, but the canons do say that recent converts who have not been tried and tested in the faith should not become priests. Non-Christian relatives, St. Paul says in, his, in his, uh, his epistle that those who do not have faithful children should not be made priests. You have to have a good witness as a priest. If the meaning before your ordination, if you have a family which has fallen away from the faith, this is a sign that you should not become a priest. Um, there are mortal sins, obviously, that would prevent someone to become a priest. Murder, theft, gravery, robbery, sacrilege, fornication, adultery, sodomy, all these are pre prevent one from becoming a priest if they've fallen into these after baptism. Even manslaughter, even manslaughter is considered an obstacle to ordination. If one who has been twice married after baptism cannot become a priest in the Orthodox Church. If one uh, it has he who married a widow, a divorced woman, a harlot, a servant maid, an actress, according to the canons, cannot be a bishop, a presbyter, or a deacon. If, a, if, a, if, your, if the wife commits adultery, and you do not, she does not leave you, or you do not leave her, but you remain with her, she, you, you, cannot become, you cannot continue as a priest, according to the canons of the church. If you are, um, even if you have a bad reputation, if you have a bad witness in the community, according to St. Paul, 
you could not become a priest. You see that the reason I, I brought up all these, which are not immediately uh, of interest for us who are lay people, for the most of us, is to show you that the church is very serious about its presuppositions for the mysteries. It guards the mysteries. Why? Because the mystery, every mystery, is Christ giving himself and being given. He is in every mystery. And so we approach him as we see in the gospel. We started out in the gospel. How did they approach him who walked away healed? With faith and with repentance, with fear of God. And that's how we approach every mystery if we're going to walk away healed. Thank you very much for listening to me today. So I'm happy to entertain questions. Or are we going to take a break? What's the program say? Whatever you think. Who wants to just continue on and who wants to take a break? <laughs> we're not democratic in the Orthodox Church. Father, just tell them what we're going to do. Wonderful, wonderful. And then we will have a nice time for questions after. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Very impressive spread. Um, so I'm ready for an any questions you might have. I am happy to answer them. Uh, anybody want, who wants to start? And you don't have to ask if you don't want to on the topic. You can ask off topic. It's your opportunity. I know that 99% of the people here have questions, but they're all wondering who's going to start. That's the problem, right? Somebody else start the questions. So you, there you go. OK. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit about preparation for confession. Uh, that's good. I didn't get to that. Thank you very much. Preparation for confession. Um, so. If you're preparing for confession at the last minute, 20 minutes before you go, an hour before you go, the night before you go, the confession is going to be a lot less productive and fruitful. I think, especially for those who are novices or beginners or recent converts, but anybody who's just starting out and they haven't done confession on a regular basis, my suggestion is to get a little booklet, just a, just a thing you can put in your pocket, and you have that and, and, and you have it with you. And you got to remember that confession is, properly speaking, confession is for a sin that separates you from the communion with God, and that's how it began in the ancient church. But confession also, in the ascetic literature, is to come to self-knowledge, to come to self-knowledge. Who am I? Who am I really? Because most of what happens is we pass our day and we forget the bad stuff, the stuff that we did, the, stuff, the thoughts we had, and then they, they get buried and they don't get dealt with. So... Part of the process of preparing for confession is going to be on a daily basis to have self-knowledge, to have mindfulness of yourself. And it's very helpful, I think, if you have a little booklet, a little pen in your pocket, and, and when you break down and you scream at your daughter, or you, you're, you have evil, you know, judgmental thoughts for your sister or your mother, you, you jot it down and you say, this is who I am. And when you go after two or three or four weeks or a month or whatever it is that you're, you're going to see your spiritual father or two months, You've got that whole list, and you go back and say, this is who I really am, and I can't, I'm not going to hide behind uh, some phrases and some, some, some niceties. So that's, that's a part of the process that helped me when I began in spiritual life, uh, in my spiritual father. I would do that. Now, I, did, I didn't continue that f forever. Eventually, I got, I got past that, but it's very helpful. It's very helpful. The other thing you would be doing is... Uh, there's some, some people in some traditions, like the Romanian tradition, have uh, the Akathis to the, our Lord Jesus Christ. They read Akathis before they go to confession. They prepare for confession prayerfully, and when they go to confession, uh, they're in a prayerful state. Um, there's also little lists of sins that one can do to look at, just practically, that helps. You can print them out on the Internet. The problem with that is if you're going... I've had people come to me and say, well, Father, um, I had one man said to me, well, here they are, here's the list, and I, I did this, this, and this. 
I said, no, that's not, that's not a confession. I mean, it, just looking at the list and going, yes, that's going to be a beginning point. But that's not going to, that, you're not doing work on yourself if that's where you, if that's where you, you remain. Okay, you got to work on yourself a lot more than that. Uh, confession is also going to be, for instance, what you didn't do, not just what you did. Right? So it's what you did not do. What, what virtues, what prayers, what frustrations, what fasting you did not do is a part of confession. When you go and you're taking, you're going to your spiritual father and you're... So confession is to be a place where you go and you see very clearly in the mirror who you are. Because the, the, if you don't come to self-knowledge, you will not come to God-knowledge. Those two things are inseparable. Right? Self-knowledge and God-knowledge go together. When you, when you begin to see who you are, the sins and the passions that trouble you, but also the things that God's given you, that you're cultivating and you should cultivate more. That's also part of this self-knowledge. Then you begin to see who, you, you, you understand the greatness of God, the glory of God, the mercy of God, and all the rest. They go together. So, I don't know, those are some practical things that I would say one would do on the way to confession. I'm sure there are more that I'm, I'm not thinking of right now. But that's, that's how I would, I would prepare. And I would go as often as possible, but definitely four times a year before, during the fasting periods. That would be something. Now, in different places, there's different circumstances. When I was in Greece and I was close to Mount Athos, I would be able to go to my spiritual father quite often even if he was on Athos. Others would see their spiritual father four times a year because they lived far away or the, the spiritual father didn't come off Mount Athos. Others would see, when their spiritual father would be their parish priest, they would see them weekly or every other week. They'd be going to confession. The Russians have confession before every communion. The Greeks do not. It's never, never been a part of the Greek tradition to, have, to associate confession and communion. And I remember the first time I went to my spiritual father in Greece, I had been used to Russian approach to confession, and it was Saturday, and I thought, well, I'll go to confession today so I can commune tomorrow. And he said, well, I can't make it today. Come after communion tomorrow. And I went, is that possible? Can you do that? So, you know, there's, diff there's different approaches, different circumstances, and different um, um, uh, ways of approaching the, the sacrament. The Russian uh, practice, in my experience, is that it's in church, it's uh, over an analogion, and you say, and, you, and you know, you're done in five or ten minutes or whatever, and you're off. The Greek practice is that you go more rarely, but you spend time. You discuss in detail all the things in your life. You're going to talk about decisions you've got to make with your children, with your spiritual father. You're going to talk about decisions you're going to make, uh, f even financial decisions, all kinds of things we would discuss with our spiritual father. It wasn't just confession of sins. It was a time when he's going to counsel us and guide us on big decisions and w the way we're living generally. And that would be a part of the whole process. So it really depends, when we talk about confession, what we mean and what the expectations are of your spiritual father. And, uh, and, and he will, of course, guide you in terms of what he wants you to do to prepare for confession. Does that help? Okay, forgive me if it's not complete. Who's the next brave soul who's gonna ask? A question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so there's two parts to my question. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, you spoke a lot about the, the crucifying of intellect. Mm -hmm. In my job, I, I have quite a sort of high performance job, so I've got to use my intellect a lot. So often I am, you know, um, it's not aligned with that spiritual self. Mm -hmm. and Well, the first part of crucifying your intellect, I don't think that you need to worry in the, in the business world and you're making business decisions, if I understand you correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. The, the whole question of crucifying your intellect is, trust, is a question of trust in God when you can't necessarily understand the will of God. So many times people say, why, Lord, why? You know, that kind of stance is not a crucifixion of the intellect and a, and, and a trust. It's, it's a doubt. And you, that, that's, not a, that's not a stance of a son who trusts the father, who's in the embrace of the father. It's a, it's a, it's a doubtful 
kind of sl soft rebellion. And so th that's where we need to work on things. Okay, so th th you, you're going to use your rational intellect and you're going to do your job and that has, that's, a, that's, that's a part of this short pilgrimage in our world here. That's not, that's not a question. So the second thing is, how do you answer pro provocations and pro uh, from the worldly spirit or the anti-Orthodox -or evangelical world? Well, <clears throat> not everyone is, is, is going to be an apologist and need to be an apologist. What needs to happen is that you, do, you, do, you don't acquiesce and agree to those, those things. Okay, let me tell you a story from the Yerodikon. There was a disciple of the great elder Arsenios who was uh, sent by his elder to go into the city. And he was on his way and he, was, he, he, might, he met a, a tradesman there, happened to be a, a Jewish man. And, and they were, he said, oh, you're coming from the desert where the monks are. And, and he said, well, you know, I don't remember the exact wording in the, in the scripture, but it was a doubt. He put a doubt out there about the divinity of Christ, the Jewish man. And the, and the disciple said, well, something like, yeah, well, you know, not really decisively saying, no, I'm not with you. He gave the impression that maybe he agreed with him, or maybe he's got a point. He goes back at the end of his, at the end of his time, he goes back to the, elder, the great elder, St. Arsenios, and St. Arsenius looks at him from a distance. I think if I've got the story right, I might get some details wrong. He turns around, he goes into the cell, and he closes the door. And the disciple's like, knocks on the door. Who are you? I don't know you. I don't recognize you. And the elder, you know, said what you did was a denial of Christ, and, and it was very minor. So we don't want to ever, ever acquiesce to the spirit and seem as if because we want, because down deep what's going on is we're trying to avoid, as St. Paul says in the Galatians, he says, they're, they're avoiding the cross of Christ. We don't want to ever avoid the cross of Christ. God forbid, he says, I boast in anything but the cross of Christ. So this is, this is what is the temptation in a variety of ways. The devil's bringing thoughts or or opportunities or provocations which are meant to suck us into an indifference to truth and a denial of Christ or a denial of the gospel. That should never happen. Now, whether you're going to give a brilliant apology to everyone who's doubting Christ, I think that's not necessarily called for. If you prayerfully have something to say, say it, confess, it's wonderful. But just never deny. That's, and never, never appear to go along with and acquiesce and be a part of that, then, then you have a spiritual fall of a very serious nature. Yes, sir. And well, look, here and then there. Are you in, you in front of the camera there? Somebody has a camera behind you? Yeah. Move, it, move, us, move aside a little bit. The camera's behind you. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, as you like. Okay. Together. No, no, no. The sacrament of baptism yes. is to be part of liturgy. Yes. All the sacraments are part of liturgy. Yes. Mm -hmm. The question is when it's separated, why it's separated, and would it help to be tried to bring it back? I don't know the exact date of its, of its separation. I cannot tell you liturgically. I think it's probably different in different places, and it's pretty, pretty late, is my guess, but I don't know. I don't know the date it's separated. Probably, certainly by the Turkish period. 
it started to separate for practical reasons. They even, during the Turkish period in the Greek world, they would even do mysteries in the houses. Uh, and so, um, can we bring it back? I think it's absolutely possible for bringing us back. It's not impossible, depending on the community, the priest, and, and it's a question of habit, it's a question of proper catechism and presentation to the faithful. It depends, of course, on practical issues. How many do you have? How often do you have them? Um, if people in Greece, for instance, in some parishes, you could have a ton of mysteries every Sunday. It would be very pra impractical to have, have them in the Divine Liturgy for practical reasons. Uh, if people agreed to, which is very hard today because we've, we've taught them that it's a special event that's not a part of the community, we've separated it from the community many times, and so we'll have a, a, we'll have a marriage, at least I'm, I'm talking about my experience, it might be different here in Australia, but you could have a, uh, a, a wedding ceremony, for instance, on, at one o'clock on Sunday at, in the parish, and two-thirds of the parish not be invited, for instance. <laughs> Obviously, if that's the case, and the community is not a, a, you know, a tight-knit community, or at least a community that sees one another, it's going to be difficult for everybody to be present. So they gotta be, there's got to be a change of mind on the part of the faithful to understand that these mysteries are part of our parish life, and that, that takes work on the part of the priest and the people to understand that. Instead of it being a personal thing, a separate you know, individual thing that we're doing at 4 or 2 on Saturday or Sunday or whatever it is that we're doing. It. Um, Saturday is the day, not Sunday, by the way, that the church ha has these mysteries. Uh, so um, it's not impossible, but it takes work. And it would mean that they would have to understand that this is a mystery that belongs to the whole community and you would be, the whole community would be, would be invited. Uh, you know, it's a practical issue. So we could, talk, we could talk about different solutions to that practical problem. It's certainly not a theological issue and it's certainly not a spiritual issue. It's, it, 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 they were made to be in the divine liturgy. Ordination is still in the divine liturgy. Uh, baptism is easily put into the liturgy. It's very simple. And the bat baptism, actually, the ceremony would be about half the time because part of it is already, the half, half of the bat baptism is reading the gospel, reading the epistle, chanting the uh, tripartia, which, which would happen in, inside the divine liturgy. So immediately the, the service would be about half as long. Um, marriage, in a similar, similar way, they would, you would, it would be shorter in the divine liturgy and would be a part of the divine liturgy. So it's not, it's not, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing, there's no, no problem with it, but it's a practical problem and a problem of changing the mindset, the mindset of the people to accept it and not think of their, their mysteries as personal individual events. You had a question, sir? Yes. So what happens if a child is really baptized and it wasn't fully immersed? Yeah, so that, that's a question people are raising more and more who are starting to understand the integrity of the mystery and all the rest. So it's one thing if, if we have a priest or a bishop or the church and we have our weaknesses and we have our errors that we commit as priests and we have our, for whatever, you know, variety of things that we do, no one's gonna, the, the integrity of the mystery is not put into question. That would be a very grave legalistic way of looking at the mystery. You know, if we miss a prayer here and there or we, Whatever, whatever the error that's committed by the priest in any of the divine liturgy or the, or the various mysteries, we have a prayer in the, in the ordination ceremony which is particularly for, the, for this, it, it talks about this, that the Holy Spirit completes and, 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 and um, rectifies this. That's one thing. It's another thing if we systematically, intentionally, and with knowledge change the, the nature of a mystery over time. And then it's a collective it's a collective uh, reality. And we, we go and we say, uh, well, it's no longer Im immersion. It's not necessary, it's not, you know, it doesn't matter. Then, then we're getting into, I think, a distortion of the Orthodox faith, the Orthodox confession of faith co and what a mystery is about. And that's where we're at. We've bought into the scholastic Latin idea that you, and this is Aquinas, this is totally Aquinas. Aquinas' theology is, is he literally says, it doesn't matter if you baptize, immerse, sprinkle, or, 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 or pour. It's all the same thing. And there were apologists in the Orthodox Church at the time, in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, which in particular, along with all the other errors that they pointed out in the Latins, they pointed out this error. They considered it an error. And, and, and after Trent, you have apologists in the Orthodox Church coming back and saying, 
because they don't immerse, we don't receive their mystery. So the fact that we've increasingly in the 20th century uh, become indifferent to the question of what exactly is happening in a baptism, what's necessary, is problematic. It's very problematic. I cannot tell you what that means spiritually for every person who's not been immersed. I'm not God, I don't know. I just know that we need to correct it. We need to correct it as qu quickly as possible. Uh, because it's not, it's, it's not just a legalistic question. If I was to start doing divine liturgy with anything but bread and wine, I would be corrected immediately, I would hope, by my bishop or fellow priests, and people would start to wonder if I wasn't, and people would start to object and say, what is this priest doing? Why is he not keeping the integrity of the divine liturgy? Why is he just putting aside as if it doesn't matter what we do in the divine liturgy, right? Wouldn't everybody be aghast if we started to change fundamental forms of a mystery? We've done that with baptism. Why? Why is it necessary? Now, you're going to tell me, well, so I hear priests in, in Greece tell, well, uh, you know, it's, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to immerse the child. That's a human weakness. I understand that. If you're afraid, you can do a lot to overcome that fear, first of all. Secondly, you can do a lot to get as close as possible to immersion if you, if you just don't. I mean, there's a lot of practical things you can do. Is it really that, or is it an indifference? That's a priest has to, a priest has to answer that. But at least we're asking the question. At least we're starting to be troubled with this indifference, if there is indifference. I was in Montenegro, um, and I was walking down from the monastery of, of Ostrog after the vigil, after the feast, about 12 years ago. And underneath the tree, there was a priest baptizing people with their clothes on, wa water over the head. You know, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just in awe. I'm wondering why. Why has this practice been accepted as if it's an Orthodox way of baptism. And it, se it seems to be an, it's been accepted in many places. I was talking to a priest in the Diocese of Batska who was struggling to baptize properly and he was getting abused by his fellow priests. Why? Why is it, why is it when you try to do a krivia, the exactitude, you are, because the implication was he's questioning and undermining their practice and, and when, you, when you do that, even without I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he was, he was doing it in a bad way. I don't know. But even if he wasn't, I can understand why it becomes a point of, of contention. Because why are you doing it that way? Are you, are you implying that we're not doing it right? So you can see that the, there needs to be a lot of work done on this particular mystery in, in a lot of places. I was talking to people in Russia when they regularly, this one young woman said to me, when I came to the church, it was 1985, and I, there was no catechism, of course, because of the Soviet period, but when they gathered us together in one room and we were baptized just with our head over the, over the, the font, like, a, like the papists. The papists, this is how the papists uh, baptized. So whatever happened, God, God help us. But at this point, when we start to realize it, it's, in, it's un, indefensible to ignore it as an, as an error, as a departure. I'll close with this. This is not my word, but this is a word of an Athenite elder. Somebody said, and I'm not saying this is the solution of the church, I'm just giving this as, a, as something to think about. And it, it, I don't know if this is the right solution. I don't know what the solution is. But somebody who was, who was troubled went to an Athenite elder and said, you know, I'm very troubled because I know I wasn't baptized correctly. I know that, that, that it was totally done in incorrectly, what do I do? And the Athenite elder thought about, about it for a while and said, the next time there's a baptism, at the end of the baptism, go, with, go there and with the water that's left from the baptism, immerse, be immersed by the priest three times. Now, did he do that because he, there's a spiritual mystery there that, that needed to be completed and that, and that way it were completed, or did he do it for the psychological shoring up of this person who felt very insecure? I don't know. But in any case, that's, there, was a, there was a sensitivity on the part of the elder and this person to do the will of God. And I don't think that's blameworthy. I don't, I don't think it's blameworthy to, do, to seek to do the will of God in, in exactitude. Now, if it becomes very legalistic, if it becomes very, you know, accusative and judgmental, then, we've, then we have a problem, right? That's a problem. So it's very sensitive how we deal with, with something like that. In any case, the consciousness of the church has to, has to, has to say, whatever happened, happened. From this point forward, 
let's work on the ecclesia, the exact duty of the church, and what God wants. Because that symbolism is very clear. When you read the treatises on baptism by the Holy Fathers, that's a big part of what they're talking about. That symbolism of dying and rising is integral to the mystery. It's integral to the theology of the church. We can't just throw that away and say it doesn't matter. You know, we can't turn away from the patristic witness of what, what's going on in that mystery. It matters what we do physically. That's the way the Lord organized things. That's the way he did it. He said, body and blood, eat it. That's what he did. We have to be faithful. We have to crucify our mind and say, well, let it be blessed. He wants us to die and rise in baptism. That's what he wants. We've got to do it. We can't play with those things. There's something wrong with that. When we, we think we can, we can tweak with it and say, well, it doesn't really matter. That's a rationalist, scholastic way of looking at the mysteries, clearly. And that's not the, that's not the orthodox way. Yes, sir. Air baptism. Well, uh, there's not much to, much to say. It's, it's, it's for children or babies or people who are in the imminent death. There's going to be imminent death. And so a layperson, the church encourages the layperson, whoever it is, to do that. Uh, if the child lives, they're baptized normally, canonically. But you're telling me it's done by grown man. Right. Yes, of course. It's not the normal way. Yes, yes. Okay, well, what? Air baptism is, let's say you're, you're in a clinic, a baby's a week old or month old, and there's, there's fear that it's going to die, and they can't take it to be baptized. It's, it's physically impossible. What do you do? If you can lift it up in the air three times and say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the church encourages to do so. And that is as an attempt on the part of the church to say, with our will and with our desire to initiate the person into the kingdom of God. And, and again, it's like the economy of the thief on the cross, right? Christ said, today you'll be with me in paradise. There was no baptism. There was no initiation. And in the same way, the church says, in this circumstance, we, we rely on the mercy of God and the love of God. If this person, this child dies, at least we've, we've attempted to initiate them and we've, we've prayed for the initiation of them into the kingdom of God. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extreme economia and in response to a situation when, in which there's no way we can do the akridia. We cannot do the, the exactitude of the, of the church. Yes, sir. Father, only one class from one thing, we're up class to two. Um, first, from the air baptism. Um, in our diocese, from my limited experience with these things, air baptisms are done. on a trial, but it's sick, and then afterwards we could make a trial. So not to create two separate categories of baptism, the sub-baptism of air. And then That's the, not the, the practice air. of the Greek church, the, the, my second, experience. The second one I'd like yeah. to ask you is you mentioned the inadmissible professions of wives of clergy. Um, so you went harlot, actress, yeah. servant maid, two others. When reading this the first time a few years back, it did strike me why were actresses mm. not allowed? I'm sure there must be some kind of historical yes. Yes. That. Yes. Could you give us a bit of background on that? And where does that type of prohibition apply? That's, a, that's up to the bishop. The bishop's going to decide that if it's applicable. The, the reason why it was then was because act, actress meant immoral life. That's what it meant to be an actress then. And also, I think there is a very reticence on the part of the church to bless acting as a way of life because we are not putting on masks in this world. We are what God made us to be, and we live every moment in, with watchfulness and with prayerfulness. So when you live your life acting the part of somebody else, spiritually, I don't think it's the ideal, and I think the church frowns on it. Uh, does it, it, by economy, allow it? That's going to be a case by case, bishop by bishop, priest by priest. But that's behind, the, it's the spirit behind the, 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 the uh, canon there is twofold. That's what an actress did in those days. It was an immoral way of life, had to do with idol worshiping and all the rest that went on to it. But also, the profession of acting, as it was in those days, was frowned upon. If you go to even 19th century Russia, St. John of Kronstadt, he's very strict on not attending the theater because it was considered a vain waste of time and also a, 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 a cultivating vanity and uh, 
uh, a loose and not a watchful way of life. So it's, it's contrary to, this, to, this, to the narrow path, the spiritual life of prayer and watchfulness, humility, and all the rest. So those virtues are not going to be cultivated in the back there. These are Orthodox Christians. The, the baptism is in an Orthodox church, but the family that's, that's doing the baptism, you're saying, is pretty much not interested in the church. And so they're and almost. Yeah. Almost anti. And so they're doing it for social reasons, for appearances and things like that. Well, th what, whatever is going on in the mind and the heart of the people who are, bapti are baptizing their child or, or grandchild is not necessarily your concern. It's the priest's concern, for sure, because, again, the presuppositions for a baptism are that the family that are, and the mother and father and the, and the sponsor, the church and the ancient church, didn't rely just on the parents. Many of them were adults anyway, so they have somebody, the anabakos in Greek, that person was responsible and charged by the church to guide them through the catechism and then after catechism to keep them on the straight and narrow. And actually they had a, that person had a lot of authority in the ancient church and was, was giving an apology or, or to the bishop saying, I vouch for this person, they're on the path of, uh, of salvation and, and there would be tests and all, all kinds of things would happen before they were baptized. So the sponsor or the godfather or godmother, along with the parents, the presupposition here, the assumption is they're Orthodox. They're Christians, they're struggling, and this person's being baptized and then being raised in that environment. Now, you have all these families who are, have been alienated for one reason or another from the life of the church, either because they're interested, they fell away, they're not interested, they fell away, whatever. What do you do? This is a pastoral crisis among all kinds of Orthodox all around the world, including in Russia, Serbia, and Greece, because we have a whole generation of people who've been alienated from the life of the church. And this is what I'm saying is that we, we are doing, I think, a disservice and damage long-term, undermining the life of the church and, and bringing in a secular spirit when we do not present them with choices they have to make. In other words, do you, Peter, also believe? Do you want to walk away, Peter? That's the question we have to ask everyone. Everyone needs to answer that question. And those people need to answer the question. And they need to be sincere about it. Now, you're going to say, well, the child's going to suffer. God is not that small. He sees every soul and their desire to be with him. We, don't, we should not be backed into a corner and have anxiety attacks because at six weeks or six months or, or two years, someone's not baptized. We have to rely on God. We can't deny the principles he set down in order to make people into Christians. It doesn't make any sense. It, it's, 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 it's backwards. So I would say the question of what you do as a lay person, well, you can play a role in consultation with the priest to try to help these people come to that point of decision, but you're not responsible for deciding whether they're gonna be, they're gonna, uh, there's gonna be a baptism or not. That's not your role. So I would say just uh, insofar as you can help them come to that self-realization, make that choice, decide whether they wanna be with Christ or not, they need to go through that. They need to say yes or no. This I'm in but I'm not in is demonic. It doesn't help anybody, right? It doesn't help the church, it doesn't help them. They never come to a point where they're faced with Christ. You know, Christ is our crisis, somebody wrote, and it's true. We need to have that crisis, it's important. He's the simian antilagomenon, they say in Greek, the, the, the sign which will be spoken against, the, for the rise and fall of many. If that doesn't happen, if he's not the sword, you know, he didn't, bring, he didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring a sword. If that sword is not going through each of our hearts, 
and, and, and spiritually speaking, we're not going to come to the point where we understand the importance of Christ. The devil wants us all lukewarm. That's what he wants. He wants the church to be lukewarm and for us never to have this is Christ, that's not Christ, here you are, you're not there. That kind of clarity he doesn't want. So you can help those people as much as you can by prayer and by some kind of example to come to that. That's good. It's good for them. Even if they say no, it's good. It's better than what they're living now. It's a lie. They're living a lie right now. Right? Correct? Am I wrong? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we got this sir here. One second, sir. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask you, to the extent, do you have any recommendations for how to do the right spiritual father? <sighs> I'll tell you what they told me when I was searching for a spiritual father 27 years ago when I became Orthodox. I went to a bishop and I said, would you, I went to many people actually, and I said, would you be my spiritual father? And they all said, no. <laughs> I said, what am, what's wrong with me? They don't, nobody wants to be my spiritual father. And he said, you'll find your spiritual father. The day will come when you'll find your spiritual father. You need to search. And in, in the, in the saying, sayings that the father that says, more or less, I'm paraphrasing, you've got to search hard and long and be patient and find your spiritual father. It may take time. And they're talking, of course, now in a different time and historical context, but the principle take. And when you find him, though, then you need to do obedience. Then you need to say whatever I, I, I submit. So don't choose quickly. Take your time. Search. And, and what are you looking for? You're looking for somebody who's faithful, who's, who's struggling. Doesn't have to be perfect. There's a delusion going around. I have to get the best elder on Mount Athos, otherwise I can't have a spiritual father. That's nonsense. If you have anybody who's Two rings above you on the ladder, he can be your spiritual father. But he's got to be somebody who's struggling, somebody who's sincere, somebody who's prayerful, somebody who has some experience, because you're going to them precisely because they're going to be able to guide you up that ladder that they've already walked. So you would not, go to, you would not want to choose somebody who is, uh, does not fit that bill, does not fit those, th those presuppositions. Um, when you, when after years of searching, I found my spiritual father, it was not unlike when I later found my wife. In other words, it was obvious. It was, there, was no cho there was no choice. It was almost as if the choice was made for me because it was so obvious. And I think that, it, you know, I had people obviously I was going to confession to for years, but I didn't have the, the guide that I was looking for that could guide me into going deeper, self-knowledge. Spiritual father has to role, play the role of one who guides the other to self-knowledge. Sometimes that's hard. And you'll hear stories from the Yeron Dikon or from the Mount Athos where they're harsh. Elder Joseph was very harsh in Elder Ephraim. Never called him by his name. I think they were together 12 years. He never said Johnny. Johnny was Elder Ephraim's name before he was a monk or Ephraim after becoming. He called him Kutsiko in Greek, which means like how do you even translate that? Just little, the, like the little stump <laughs> or something like this. I'm not translating it well. But anyway, he never, so this was, this is what he did, though, out of tremendous love to bring him to self-knowledge, to humility, to keep him grounded spiritually. Um, so the spiritual father is not going to be one who's going to praise you. He shouldn't. He's not going to be one that's going to justify you much. He shouldn't. He'll console you. He'll encourage you. But he'll also put you in front of the mirror. Say, this is who you are. Deal, you got to deal with it. You got you to face your uh, passions and your sins. So that's the kind of person I think that you would look for. Somebody who's made progress ahead of you, who's struggling himself, who's prayerful, fear, fear of God. Certainly not going to be an ecumenist in the sense that they're not going to be playing with the dogmas of the church. I wouldn't go to a spiritual father who, who can't respect the boundaries of the canons and the dogmas f far away from me because they're not going to teach me the path of the narrow way. So if, if someone has succumbed to the heresy of delusion of ecumenism, meaning that they don't confess the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, don't take them as a spiritual father. So obviously those kind of errors, dogmatic, you know, grave canonical errors are a disqualification for a spiritual father. This man here and then behind. Yes. Uh, Father, would you be able to say 
<laughs> Put me on the spot here. I don't know. <laughs> you know what the Lord says about miracles? That the, that, the, that the the faithless, the unbelievers, seek after miracles. You don't need a miracle. You you have Christ. You don't want me to talk about that. If I had if I had some something that I thought that would I would show share with you which would be beneficial to you, I would share it. But I don't think it's good to talk about those personal, you know, events that the Lord has given to you for your benefit. If it's something that, you know, I can. There are there are a lot of miracles. They're not, but they're not miracles like the kind you're thinking, like you know, flashing lights and and um, you know, miraculous healings. But the Lord has worked many miracles in the sense of His providence and the. Um, I think the greatest miracle he worked was, for me, was uh, the way that I, I met my wife, which was miraculous. But it's something I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think that I want to share. So, oh, I yeah. did not ask you of your personal... Ah, okay. A miracle from the saints or something. That's what I understood. Yes, yes. Some, something that you got in your baggage. Ah. <laughs> ah. Let me think about it a little bit. We'll ask some other questions. I can't. <laughs> let me come to mind right now. Go ahead. As you mentioned earlier, uh, in the U.S., there's, uh, there's a lot of mixed marriages. Yes. And this is happening here. Uh, and it's unstoppable. Now, the, what the question I'm asking is, if a person has been baptized with the altar boy and he's married a, a Muslim, mm. Mm-hmm. as a friend child with me also now <clears throat> the question is should she assist in the uh, baptizer child canons forbid it absolutely she's apostate the minute you marry a Muslim you're an apostate so how is that measured like she's going to a church She shouldn't be communing. So it's got to be herself. In the Greek of Church of Greece, the contemporary practice, which is the application of the canon, just to give you an idea, is if you don't have a marriage within the church, in other words, you just have a civil marriage and you're not married, which is not a marriage for us, right? There's nothing sacramental about it. You can't be a, 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 a godfather or godmother. And that's a person who's attending church but it's the same situation. So how much more someone who, who is married to a Muslim? When you marry a Muslim, you're departing from the church because marriage is not some, uh, marriage for us is a sacrament. And now you've, you've, you've disdained the sacrament of the church, you've disdained the communion of the church by uniting yourself to, a, to someone who, who disdains the Holy Trinity. How can, you be a, how can you be a guarantee of the faith of somebody if you're apostate? So it doesn't make any sense. Well, if the priest is allowing it, God help him. God help him. What if he hasn't been in life? How, how, how can that priest sleep at night? You're not guiding anybody on the path of salvation by... This is not, a, uh, this is not economy. There's no economy here. It's just, it's just a paranomia uh, in Greek. It's not economia. There's got to be boundaries. And how is this person going to come to come back to Christ if you're saying that they can do that and be in Christ? Because when you sit, make somebody a godmother or a godfather, you're saying the church has chosen her or him to guide others on the path of Christ. How's somebody, how do you, how's that person going to do that when they're not even on the path of Christ? So if a priest is going along with that and not, and not permitting that, I mean, I don't, it's, it's mind-boggling. I don't see how it's possible. You, you, the, the most you can do is counsel whoever wants to hear you, but you can't, you're not the priest and you're not the bishop, and you can, but you can certainly distance yourself from somebody who's making that decision. I don't think this is a sign of, of godly-minded uh, wisdom. So the proximity in, in Crete. But so, we'll come back to that question. Let's go to somebody else and then, yes, ma'am.
In Jordan, in the Jordan River. No, no, it's not a baptism. It's a ritual. You weren't baptized in the baptismal service. Yes. Ah, you're saying you're saying is that uh, no? Well, that, that, in the Jordan River, are they are they conducting a baptismal service? They're reading the prayers of baptism. They're no. It's just it's just a ritual. It's a ritual of of commemoration of the event. Yeah. Well, uh, why is, uh, you're gonna have to give me more details. What, what, is, what about being in a multicultural society means you, don't, you can't love them? Okay, can you give an example? Sometimes you love them. Yes. Well, love, love, is not, love and truth are inseparable. So if you, if you mean you're called to love them, meaning tolerate and embrace their, uh, their, their ano anomalies in terms of moral issues and things like that. We're not just talking about they're, they're from, not from Serbia, they're from, you know, I don't know, France. That, obviously, the, that, that's not a qu question. We, that's not a, there's no obstacle to loving them because they're from another country. But if they're asking you to cross the boundaries and embrace a, a deformity of human nature and a, 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 a anti-evangelical teaching, you, you have to stop at that point and say, I love the person I hate. I love the sinner. I hate the sin. I cannot embrace the sin. I love the sinner, though. And I, you're going to forgive me, but I'm not going to, I cannot agree that this is something that needs to be embraced and encouraged because I love this person. And if I say that this, this, this uh, distorted way of, of understanding humanity is good for that person, I'd be lying. I can't separate love from truth. Otherwise, I'm denying both. I'm denying both at the end of the day. I'm not loving, and I'm not bringing anybody to truth, and I'm not in the truth. So it is time, it's the time of confession, if this is before us. I'd have to see the circumstances, what they're asking you to do, and all the rest, before I could counsel you. But no, there's no question that we cannot appear, even, to embrace a, an anthropology which is hateful to God. That's what they're telling us. They're saying that it's, it's normal, it's good, it's to be celebrated. Uh, uh, homosexuality, transgender identity complexes, and all the rest of the stuff, none of that is of God. And none of that is good for humanity. So we cannot appear to embrace that. I'm not saying you have to go and become, you know, flayed alive tomorrow, but you cannot appear to embrace that. Now, there's there's, there's times in the church's um, history where you see people like St. Cyprian of Carthage, during the persecution, he fled to the mountains. Later on, he came back and he was martyred. So there's times when, when we're not ready to be martyred, and we, we have to prepare ourselves. But we cannot flee from that responsibility. We cannot say, it's not my, my business. We can't say, I agree with it so I can get along with everybody. That's not possible, and to be in the, in the truth. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that everybody's gonna, tomorrow is gonna go out and wave a, wave a flag and say, I'm against you know, the rainbow or whatever. No, but when the time comes, be prepared to say, forgive me, but I believe in Christ. I believe that humanity, God intended us to be boy and a girl. You can't change those things, and all the rest that's going on in society. That's a part of being an Orthodox Christian. Those distortions, that blurring of the boundaries is as bad and it's in the same kind of demonic activity as the blurring of the boundaries of the church, as the blurring of the person of Christ. Is he one or two natures? Is he God and, or is he man? Is he both? All of those, all of the blurring of the boundaries on many levels is demonic. It's not of God. God laid down the boundaries. He put the sea and the, and the dry land. He put the boundaries of the nations. He put an angel over every nation. He put an angel over every baptized Christian. He put those boundaries there. It is demonic to overturn them. It is, it is, it is contrary to his plan for every human being. It's a distortion of our human nature. We cannot appear to be in agreement with that. 
We're going to bury people in their sin. And we're going to be co-responsible. So we can't. We can't. Now, again, this particular is you have to talk to your spiritual father and see how I'm going to handle this. I'm in the workplace. They're saying this. All those things need wisdom and discernment. But according to that, those principles can't be contrary to those principles. Yes? I think we all know the answer to that, don't we? Orthodoxy is not a religion. In the sense of religion being the pursuit of man for God, right? The ascent of man toward God. That's what a religion is in this context. Now, you could define the, the term differently. It's used in Orthodox texts positively as well. And the, the Latin term religio means essentially that which binds us together. So in a very general sense, we could say, yes, Orthodoxy binds us together. It's a religion. But usually what we mean by religion is it's a human uh, invention or a human desire for God, just like all the religions of the world. In other words, they put us in the same category as every other attempt and, and imagination of God. They want to put orthodoxy on the same level as Hinduism, Judaism, Islam. It's one of the major religions. In that sense, absolutely not. Orthodoxy is not a religion because Christ didn't come to start a religion. Christ started, came to do away with the religions of the world. Christ revealed himself. He's life. He gives us life. Orthodoxy is life. Orthodoxy is the body of Christ and Christ himself. And we are initiated into his life. It's nothing to do with anything that man made. It's divine human. It's a divine revelation and a, and a synergy of God and man together. So absolutely not. It's not a religion in that sense. It's revelation and it's, and it's life. It's a way of life. Somebody had a question here. Yes. In Tumatoros, Orthodox case, what is it? Orthodox case, two words. What does it mean in Greek? In Greek, uh, right opinion in the ancient Greek or right glory is how we usually try to define it in orthodoxy. So right, um, right dogma, you could say, right understanding of who God is, correct understanding. Mm -hmm. My question is that the, uh, the sinner Well, Christ was on the cross. He, t he looked at his persecutors and he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Did they understand what they were doing? Did they repent for what they were doing? He still forgave them. It's a characteristic of an Orthodox Christian to love our enemies. And why, why can, how can we love our enemies? Because we don't have them as enemies. They might have us as enemies. Of course, the church has enemies. Of course, the church has enemies. Not because the church has them as enemies, but because they stand against us. They fight us with the enemy of our salvation and they fight against us but we don't see them as enemies and whether they repent whether they love us or not we see them as brothers and we see Christ in them we see the image of Christ in them so when we see our brother and we love them we're loving Christ in them in spite of their sin in spite of their hatred in spite of their delusion yes it's a hard it, you, it's hard because you're trying to do it alone Everything we try to do, every virtue is hard when we're doing it alone. We've got to call on God. We've got to call on God. We've got to pray to God. God, help me to love my enemy. Help me to see him, he, he, your image in him. But you, remember this. If you don't, you're cutting yourself off from God. Because God loves them. God loves everyone. God, the sun shines on everyone. The rain comes down on everyone, whether they're good or bad. He sends the rain for all of us. He loves them because they're his image. And it's inseparable. If you want to be vertically with God, you've got to be horizontally with humanity. Both of them are necessary. In the Second World War, uh, Roman Catholics together with the Croatians yes. killed almost one million. Yes. And how can we forgive them? You know? If it's nature, they're going to fight us again. How can I love them? If you don't love them, and then the enemy is victorious over you. You've lost out to the enemy. You don't see who the real enemy is. It's not the person who's the victim of the enemy. The enemy is Satan who's trying to keep you away from your brother and God. Both of them together. It says in the gospel, the epistle of St. John, you say you love, your, you love God but you hate your brother? You're a liar. Those two loves have to go together or you don't have real love for God. You see, this is what we don't, we, we think we can love God and hate our enemy. Impossible. We're liars. 
But that's what our Lord did. He didn't, he's not asking us to do anything that he didn't show us first. And the reason why we can't do it is because we're not calling on him and his grace. We're thinking we can do it on our own. And we're looking at it only horizontally. We're not seeing it from divine perspective. We're not seeing that all those people are made in his image. They're all victims of the enemy. And God wants their salvation. And the only way we're, they're going to be saved is if we love them. If we hate them too, who's gonna, how are they going to be saved? If they're going to be saved. And of course, it's their decision. You can't force them. Yes. The miracle, the miracle. Gosh, I, nothing comes to mind right now. I don't know. Uh, huh? Yes, yes, the, the, the Jews and the Greeks, right. Uh, you had a question over there, and then we'll go to the, the lady here. The Cretan Council. I gave, I gave a big lecture on that online. You could, you could go and watch it or read it. Before the thing inside her is um I cannot say difficult to to find someone that's really not in that direction. Mm -hmm. So you think most people are, are just happy with the Cretan Council, don't have any problem with it? Well no, I mean a lot of people that are on the business don't know. Don't know, yeah. How many people even know what happened in Crete? Let's, or how many people do not? Raise your hands if you, you have no idea what happened in the Cretan Council. Yeah. The Russians didn't come and the Serbs shouldn't have gone. <laughs> they were almost not going to go and then somebody convinced them. Anyway, so what, what do you, what's the question? What do you want me to talk about? Yeah, so here's, here's where we're at in the whole question of the Cretan Council and heresy generally, because what the problem with the Cretan Council, besides it being structurally unorthodox, and, if, and I could talk about that, I could do a whole count, you know, lecture on that again, but the, the way that it was designed, the way that it was made, the way that they carried it out, has nothing to do with orthodox tradition. It was a total innovation. They had primates voting on behalf of their local churches. They only had 24 bishops from each local church. Some of them only had 15, 17 bishops. They had bishops signing on behalf of other bishops. They had bishops ignoring, I mean, the, the primates of the church ignoring the votes of other bishops. It just goes, it goes on and on. It was a disaster from all kinds of perspectives. It was not in the orthodox manner. So it was, of course, not going to be an orthodox council, whether they had beautiful orthodox texts or not, the way they carried it out was not according to the tradition of the church. On top of that, unfortunately, they had w at least one document, probably two or three, if you really want to get picky and talk about the tradition of the church on these issues, the one having to do with the heterodox was heterodox. <laughs> it was not an orthodox text. And it, the reason why it was an orthodox text was because they spoke of heterodox churches, I mean, heterodox confessions as churches. Now you can say, well, we always talk about the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church. That's true, but not in the context of a council of the church, church's bishops, and they're expected to rightly divide the word of truth and use terms as the fathers use them. That's what the context was. Many people went online, Sister Vasa, I think, was one of the most well-known. She went online and said, what's the big deal? And she pointed to a lexicon and says, in this lexicon, you can see that the fathers use this term you know, for, for non-Orthodox. She, but she's neglecting to say that the, that the context was supposedly, it was supposed to be for years and years, an ecumenical council that was going to teach us what the truth of the church is. And when we talk about church in the Orthodox Church, we mean the body of Christ. There's no other kind of church that exists when we're dogmatically talking about the Orthodox Church. It means the body of Christ. There's only one body of Christ. There's never two or three. And so when we talk about the, 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 the heterodox churches, the term itself is nonsensical. You can't, there can't be a virgin harlot. Okay, that's what that means. Heterodox means not orthodox, 
It means not having the one glory of God. It's not the, the, the right opinion of God. And then you put the word church, which means body of Christ. There can't be a body of Christ which does not understand and does not represent, does not confess Christ. So the whole, the whole approach was very superficial, diplomatic, worldly, and it needs to be rejected by the Orthodox Church for those reasons. And there were plenty of people, plenty of very good theologians who made that case, and I, I pretty much just repeated them in English. Um, so what do we do now after three years? The good news is, for the most part, as Metropolitan or Bishop Irene Mavatska said, it died, it's death, it's over, it's forgotten. And that's really, in practice, what's happening in most of the Orthodox world. Sure, the Greek Patriarchate of Constantinople has, of course, said that we must support it, of course, because they're the ones who called it. But you can see people from all around the Orthodox world, they're ignoring its decisions. They're not considering it a consensus. The fact that four local churches didn't go uh, pretty much tanked the council as any kind of authority throughout the whole Orthodox Church. What needs to happen, though, is not just to ignore it. I think, and I said many times, any time there was a false council, another council was called to, de to denounce it and to, and to rightly divide the word of truth. So you have the false council of Ephesus, and then you have Chalcedon a year later, two years later, right? They didn't just leave it to fester. The fathers weren't, oh, it's, it's all right, we have a council that didn't write the Orthodox faith, we'll just ignore it. Never happened. After the f f uh, Florence, they had a council in, in Constantinople, and they condemned it, and they re repudiated it. That's how you deal with false counsels. Is that going to happen again? Well, that's our, that's our prayer. And the good news is that I think what's happening in Ukraine is the oh, beginning. Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah, what about Ephesus? Yeah, now we're, we're, we're reeling from Ephesus right now. But, but I think what is going to happen is that, that this uh, debacle of Crete has now brought in its wake the fiasco of Ukraine. And it's a fiasco, what they've done. It's unbelievable what they've done. I mean, it's, it's, it's so anti-canonical. It's not just anti-canonical. It's, it's not, there's no love and there's no, there's the, the Orthodox spirit and the ethos is not, is not there in Ukraine. It's going to backfire. The local churches are rejecting it. Even churches that are, that are very closely tied to the Ecumenical Patriarchate, like the Church of Albania, seems to be rejecting it. So I think that's the beginning of a, of a correction to Crete, ultimately. And it might not be exactly condemning everything, but it'll be a correction. That's my hope. I have no other hope. I mean, in God I have my hope, but I mean, that's, that's what I see on the horizon as, as a hope for us, that they're going to be starting a process of correcting this excess and this delusion uh, uh, of how the church operates. It's ultimately an ecclesiological heresy. The way that they're trying to operate the church, the way they, the vision of the church is not orthodox. And it's very clear in the Ukraine. It's not how the orthodox church operates. Does, it's not papal, doesn't have that kind of he heavy-handed dictatorial approach. Uh, and, uh, and that's what they were doing in Crete. Crete was, this, was, a, was a council of primates uh, which, which failed, because that's not how the councils work. We don't, we don't have 14 primates to make the decision for us. Primates are the heads of the local churches. That's why it was a failure, because they tried to do something that never was done in the history of the church. We don't keep bishops out and then call it an ecumenical council. That's what they were doing. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, when we ask to give money to people. Um, I have to give it as an example because I think that will make more sense. So there's a man in our, in our area who is homeless, um, looks homeless, but very evidently he has started using drugs. He will stop a lot of people. He stops me very often to ask for money. I know we're not meant to ask, what the money is for, but I feel like I'm actually contributing to his downfall mm -hmm. by giving him. Mm -hmm. And I give him, but my heart doesn't give mm -hmm. him. My heart judges him, my mm. hand gives him. Mm. So mm. Okay, so what's, what do you do? 
Yeah, what would I do? <laughs> what would I do? First of all, just generally about how we give, in my understanding of things. Uh, if we start to analyze each person that asks for us and whether they're worthy of our giving, we're, we're not on a good path. The fact that the providence of God has brought this person before me and I see Christ in him and I'm trying to love Christ, like the Lord says in the Gospel, Matthew 25, you gave the least of these you gave to me. It says in the Yerod they call and you saw your brother, you saw your Christ. Okay, that's the approach we're going to have to every human being. And we're going to trust the providence of God that this person needs my loving hand. What I give him is another question. He wants money, but I, I'm almost... 99% sure that that money is going to be used to destroy him. I don't think you're required to give him money. Give him something else. Give him food. Give him some other expression of your love. But give him something. Yes. Yes. A little bit louder. A little bit louder so everybody can hear. Mm -hmm. uh, in a circumstance where an Orthodox marries a Catholic in the Orthodox Church, and they have a child and they want to baptize that child in an Orthodox Church, how would I? How would one be? How would it one be a, um, a, a former a, a good parent? A good parent to the child. Mm -hmm. So the, the Orthodox father marries, a, or mother marries a Roman, and it's done in the Orthodox Church by so-called economia, and now they have a baby, and they're asking you or somebody to be the godfather. Mm. Yeah. I would probably accept, and I would do my best to uh, support that child in spite of this basis of this whole thing being very problematic and I would try to pray and work for the conversion of this person who's not orthodox. Uh, it's, it, because it's a done deal, it's happened, it's passed, you can't change what happened. Should it have happened? I don't think there's any basis for it to happen. As I said, theologically, I can't, ex I can't explain it. I don't, know what that ha I don't know what happened at that marriage. I cannot explain theologically what happened. Because again, a marriage is three people. How did that happen? When the person is not initiated into Christ, not baptized, not communing, how does it happen? Somebody needs to explain that to me, theologically. There is no defense. But in any case, that happened. And now you're before that reality, and they're in the church, and this person, the child's going to be baptized. Well, it has, one, it has one of the two that are Orthodox. That person, how much they're living the Orthodox faith in this context is very hard for me to understand. It's a case-by-case, case, it's a case-by-case, case, you know, Reality. Yes, yes, and there's a lot of them, and uh, I think that I think that uh, you know not every single couple that comes and wants a mixed marriage is going to be able, obviously, is going to be able to be shown the church and the person be baptized and chrismated. But so I, I'm not saying that 100% of the time we can we can bring them into the faith. But it seems like we're not even trying most of the time. It seems like we've given up and we've accepted as a done deal and this is the way life is and this, you know, you said it's a, what did you say? It's a, in, a, in a Australia it's, a, it's, it's very, you know, advanced. Yeah. So the, the, the pastoral approach seems to be one that's, that's defeatist, defeatist. I think that, that a, a good catechist and a good priest over time could do much more to bring them to the faith. If we're really shining the love of Christ and shining the grace of God, if, if people are coming to the faith and they're ready to, there's much more we could be doing. It sounds like we've made a decision that there's no problem with this. It's okay. We can reconcile ourselves with this. And again, I don't see any basis for that in the Orthodox. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. on the other hand, we turn around saying, well, well I'm going to do an anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, 
No, it's very difficult. I'm not, I don't want to belittle the pastoral problems here. They're may, many and difficult, but there will never be an orthodox solution unless it's on orthodox principles. And that's where we got to start. Many people come to these issues of chrismation or baptism, mixed marriages or not, all these difficult issues. They come to them at the human level, the horizontal level, the personal level, the historical level. They don't start with Christ. You've got to start with Christ. And that means the, the body of Christ. And that means the mysteries of Christ. And you start there and then you try to work out a pastoral solution. It seems like we're working, at, working against the stream. We're not going the way of Christ, we're going the way of the world, and we're saying, well, it's a given that this is not going to happen. It's a given that we, this can't be worked out in the context of the church and on the principles of the church. And of course, it's, they're not going to be, if that's our approach. Any other questions? We're keeping people pretty late, so people are getting tired. One last question? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You can answer. Yeah. Yes. How great is that darkness? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a big question. I don't know if you all heard it, but she's talking about the passage where the Lord says, "If you're, uh, if the eye of these, and I don't remember exact scriptural passages, but the, if the eye is simple, single, single or simple or clear or aplos, ap, uh, simple, uh, the whole of your." The whole of your body is light. If it's darkness, how great is that darkness? And the question is, how do we get... Si yes, the light within you is darkness. So, so this, the whole question is spiritual simplicity or spiritual oneness, wholeness, is another way to put this. Because what, 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 what happens is we're distracted and we're lost in creation. You see, we're lost in, in the created world. And that's why we're, we're multifaceted and we become schizophrenic or become contradictory becomes you know this 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 is when we're not collected within ourselves and the only way that we can be collected within ourselves and the kingdom of God is through deep prayer and the the hesychastic way is the Jesus prayer and that's what brings us and collects ourselves in ourselves and we become simple and and so that's the whole way of the hesychast is stillness external and internal that stillness that, that the Lord, that you're talking about there, that simplicity, that stillness that's internal, that's what the, ex the external stillness is supposed to assist us in. You could have an external um, uh, peace and quiet and have internal chaos, so there's no guarantee, but it, it assists. And so that's why at the heart of the Orthodox Church is the Jesus prayer and this watchfulness and this internal stillness that, that we're seeking. And, how, and so obviously, if you have all kinds of distractions in your life, you're not going to be able to collect yourself to begin with. So you've got you've to make life simple, simple externally as much as possible. We're going the opposite direction in today's world. You know, we're, we're adding more and more distractions and more and more uh, confusion. So, and that's not an accident. That's a, that's a fruit of our apostasy. It's a fruit of our apostasy. 
So simplify, the elder Paisus talks about, simplify your life, simplify everything, and, and, and it, it, it brings more peace. And he says the more efkolias, the more ease and comfort, the more discolias, the more difficult life is. So he talks a lot about it in his writings. Who, who's read the, the writings of Elder Paisus in English? If, if not, it's very valuable. There's like four or five volumes. And he talks a lot about this, about the, the superiority of having a very simple life. And that m the more that you make, you struggle to make it externally easy, the more you complicate your life. So, f so that's one aspect of it. The other is, the other is going gonna, is gonna to be ultimately... Um, turning inward and turning to prayer and the Jesus prayer. I think that's the path to this simple, simpleness. Uh, concentrating on the name of Jesus and going deeper and having that as a prayer rule and having that as a daily life in your daily life. I was telling people down in, uh, where was I? I was with the, I was with the priest, but also down in, in Melbourne about Elder Ephraim and what, what happened when a little monk from Mount Athos with, with a little prayer robe came to America and in 20 or 30 years, he built 19 monasteries and ten, you know, thousands of people came back to the church through his confession and through, and it was all on the basis of the Jesus prayer. That was, that's the core of everything he does. He teaches it everywhere he goes and every, everybody in the monastery and everybody that his disciple, the Jesus prayer is the heart of their life. So I think that's a big part of being simple. You know, it's, that it, it's, it, 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 it collects in one prayer the whole of the Orthodox tradition, it purifies and it illumines at the same time. It purifies and it illumines at the same time. That's the work that needs to be done within the heart of man. The, the, the noose or the spirit of man or the, the eye of the soul, that's what the Lord's talking about. If that's light, then all of you is light. All of your thoughts are going to be light, your rational intellect, your way. Remember I was talking about earlier how the whole man is sanctified, and, and maybe I was a couple days ago, I've lost track of when I was speaking and what I was saying and what city. Uh, but the whole man is sanctified all of his life, not just his thinking, not just his moral life, not just his social life, but his every movement, his every, the every movement of his soul and body and heart and his thoughts, words and deeds, all of it is sanctified. And it's sanctified through the prayer and the noose going into the heart and this, this stillness taking place. So the whole of the hesychastic tradition screams this, this. If you want to begin to, to do that, there's a lot of texts out there. You can I mean, the way of the pilgrim is one of the best, still one of the best. And Elder Joseph Hesychast really liked it, the first volume, and he recommended it. So I would, I would recommend to anybody. It's easy for anybody to pick up with. It's a wonderful story, and it teaches tremendously. The way of the pilgrim. The way of the pilgrim, the classic text from Russia. Uh, yes, yes, the classic text from Russia. It's simple and, and, and approachable. If you haven't read it, you have to read it. You have to read it. It's very important. And then after that, I would go to, I would go to some of the contemporary elders who talk all about the Jesus Prayer. The life of Elder Joseph the Hesychist, or Elder Ephraim's teachings, or any number of contemporary elders who talk about the Jesus Prayer, I would, I would go there. And of course, you need to work with your spiritual father and get a rule and begin saying the Jesus Prayer every morning. You know, I would, I'll, t I'll tell you what the novice does at Mount Athos, and then you apply it to, to your life. Obviously, it's not going to be as much as the novice at Mount Athos because we're not, we don't have that kind of lifestyle. But that's where they begin at Mount Athos, to give you a sense of a rule. What's a spiritual rule for the Jesus Prayer? Can you read that? What's that? Can you read that to us now? Can I, can I tell you that? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what they did, the, the novice does on Mount Athos, and then everyone, of course, needs a blessing before they do it, and they need to have a spiritual father guiding them. But just to give you a sense where they start on Mount Athos, right? So a, a novice in most places would get something like, they would say the Jesus prayer in the morning when they woke up, they would make the sign of the cross with every Jesus prayer, they would do 900 of those. 300, the prayer rope has 300, they would do three of these. With the, with, the, with the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy And then they do 600 or 900 more without the cross. And then they do 300 with the cross to the Mother of God, Most Holy Theotokos Sevas, 200 without the cross. And then they would have anywhere between 100 and 200 prostrations. And then they would sit down and they'd read the scriptures, they'd read the lives of the saints, they'd read the fathers. That would take them probably two hours 
reading, frustrations, and prayer rope. Probably the prayer rope af after a while wouldn't take them more than 40, 45 minutes to an hour, huh? How about seven days for me? Seven days for you. Yeah, it sounds like a lot, but actually it's not because it, they do it very quickly. After a while, the mind picks it up and it becomes, <laughs> it's kind of like a river. A river runs over, in the beginning, the, 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 the soil, right? But if it runs and runs and runs and runs, it's going to go deeper and deeper and make a deeper implant in the soil until it hits rock. And that's what the Jesus Prayer does. It cleanses and it cleans and it, and it, and it creates in the soul a, a river of prayer that, that, that goes deep and, and, and leaves an indelible mark on it. And, then it. and then the prayer runs very quickly. When it hits the rock, the water runs very quickly. And when the prayer gets deeper and deeper and you say it, I, I remember going to an elder and saying, you know, because they were doing the prayer robe for the, for the matin service. Instead of doing matins, they would do it in their cell on the prayer robe. They would say, Lord Jesus Christ. I said, how, how many do you do? Oh, about 2,500, 3,000. I said, w when do you do that? I, it's like, when do you get up? When do you? He said, he said, it goes very quickly. I said, still a couple thousand times. I mean, how? So, you know, it's beyond, it's beyond us who've not reached that, that degree of prayer, but it becomes so, so much a part of, of their consciousness that, the, that it, if they go very, very quickly, it becomes one with them. And now, somebody who's doing that night and day, you know, Elder Joseph de Hesychus would, would start at sundown sun and end around in the morning with divine liturgy. So they're doing eight hours, ten hours of continuous prayer of the heart. This is, and they're in noetic prayer. They're not doing it with the mouth. They're doing it noetically in their heart. So that's the kind of, that's where you get into the real light of the noose and then the light of the whole body, and everything is, is illumined through that kind of prayer. It's not going to be just reading the prayer book or reading the services. You've got to go deeper in the prayer rule in your cell with the Jesus prayer. Thank you. That'll, we'll end that on that note. And anybody who wants to come up and ask me, thank you so much, Father, for your patience. Oh, say.